Hey guys, welcome to part 6 of what if Naruto became a one man team, if you enjoy the video then like, share and subscribe and also comment your thoughts as it inspires me to make more such videos and remember to check out my playlist section for other interesting stories. So let's get started. Chapter 17. The Finals Naruto's Match. Flashback asterisk asterisk. It had been two weeks since the preliminaries and Naruto finally decided a small break from training was in order to keep a promise he made. After making arrangements he left his house that afternoon and made his way to a remote training ground where he found the one who asked him for an audience. She stood in the middle of the clearing, polishing her battle fan as she waited. Tamari-san, what is it you called me out here for? He waited patiently while she finished the spot she was polishing before storing the fan on her back once more and turning towards him. Naruto-san. I was hoping I could talk to you about. She turned away suddenly. I really shouldn't be talking about this, but. Konoha is going to be attacked during the finals. I see. She turned to him again, confused. You sound awfully calm considering that news. She narrowed her eyes at him. I had suspected something big would happen. A new village attending Chunin exams, along with your cage and a Jinchuriki. It surprised Tamari that he knew what her brother was, but she hid it as well as she could. It was pretty obvious it was going to happen. Since you've confirmed my suspicions and given us the date, we might be able to be better prepared, but. I'm more concerned about why you are trying to help us. You clearly have issues with this village if your performance against Tenten was anything to go by. Naruto narrowed his eyes in suspicion as Tamari again turned away. That was different. I was frustrated, in part, but I also wanted to show off a bit. Dot dot. Being a cage's daughter has its disadvantages, not that you'd know. I don't really get to hang around with anyone other than my brothers and my sensei. I guess you could say I found someone I was interested in here and I was trying to impress him. I think I only made him angry though. I was hoping this would make it even for what I did to that girl. She lowered her head a bit. It was the closest to a confession she was willing to come out with. Well I can't say what this guy would see from this, but you have my thanks regardless. Good luck in the finals Tamari-san. Naruto leapt off into the trees as Tamari spun around to get another word in, but the boy was already gone. She sighed to herself. Story of my life. Naruto sped towards the Hokage Tower with his new information and arrived just as the old man was about to leave. Hokage-sama, I need a quick word with you. The old man nodded and stepped aside from the door to allow the boy to enter. Hokage-sama, I have been informed that there is to be an invasion during the finals of the Chunin exam. Hmm, that is disturbing. Who was it that gave you this information, and why? Tamari-san from the Suna team. As to her reason, it seemed to be somewhat of a personal matter that is inconsequential. I would like to question her further, but this close to the exams, taking her from her team would be far too suspicious. The old man pinched the bridge of his nose. If he were to take the case cage's daughter and interrogate her he risked an international event. Forget an invasion, they would be able to make demands if it was just a trick. What would you do Naruto-kun? Prepare for what we know already, and what we can assume. What we know is that Orochimaru is around and that he's the cage of sound. He could definitely be leading an invasion if he has a country behind him, but even he can't gather a force big enough to take on Konoha by itself, so that would mean. The old man picked out the information he could deduce. Suna. Naruto finished for him. Our alliance has been tight of late. It would be possible that my old student swayed them to his side. It is disturbing though to think that Case Cage Sama would side with such a traitor. The Hokage was disturbed by the thought. They had worked hard for the treaty with Suna, but he may have been a bit too greedy in taking missions from the Kei's no Kuni Daimyo. It would be that most rational reason as to why Tamari-san would have known about any invasion at all. I'm certain her team has a large part to play in it. Oh, why is that? Gara-san is, like me. Naruto patted his stomach with on hand and watched the cage's eyes widen in realization. Asterisk 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 and flashback asterisk asterisk. It was now a full month after the preliminaries and many things were going on in Konoha that got all of the citizens excited, almost enough for them to forget that they didn't have a council representing them anymore. Not that things changed much after those pompous morons were taken out of the picture. 
Now though they had so many more new customers and new people to talk to about upcoming events. There were issues of course with some tense relations between certain countries, but all in all it was just like a big festival. Street side stalls sold treats and had games to play, while adults walked around and took in the sights. In the shadows however, preparations were taking place. The Hokage had spread news of the possible attack to those that remained on the council and proposed that they take the possibility of an attack seriously as there will be far too many important people around to risk being ignorant. Thus, various ninja were busy setting up traps and ambush points, coordinating strike points or keeping evacuation routes clear. They wouldn't start that process until the attack happened though in order to keep the guys up that they were unaware. The risk to the civilians was considered acceptable in order to keep the village as a whole safe. For those that would be contending in the main events though it was an experience in and of itself. Naruto was up earlier than the others, as he had much more to prepare for. As if being in the finals for the exam wasn't enough, he also had taken it upon himself to go all out today when the attack happened. Thus he was now wearing some custom black cargo pants with numerous pockets that were quickly being filled as he shoved massive amounts of sealed supplies in them. He had enough weapons to make Tenton jealous and stacks of pre-made seal tags of all types. Explosive and smoke bombs, spools of ninja wire, soldier pills and ointments made specially by Haku and Hanada. Kin had offered to help them, but due to her lack of knowledge she was only able to bottle the concoctions up and label them. She seemed happy enough though to help in any way she could, but Naruto was a little irked that she still called him Sama. Still, he didn't get to see much of them over their month break. Ino was forced to help her parents run their flower shop while they prepared decorations for the festivities, and no one had seen hide nor hair of Tenten. It was assumed she was helping Neji train from his fight with Naruto. Haku and Kin were normally busy training in the backyard or sparring with Hinata while Naruto was either off training somewhere with Jiraiya, talking with the Hokage about something or another regarding his training or the invasion, locked in his office or just nowhere to be found at all. He knew this irritated them, but all he would tell them about it was that it was necessary. They saw the other two members of Team 8 once during the break, and that had to be explained to him by a grinning Haku. Asterisk 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 flashback asterisk asterisk. So what was the other thing you wanted Harum Chan? Haku asked, then got even more curious as the girl got a deep blush. Something she never thought she'd see on the tomboy's face. Harum gulped and leaned into Haku's ear, whispering so only they could hear. Haku's head shot up and stared into her friend's eyes. And no way, really. When Harum nodded Haku smiled devilishly. Leave it to me. They both shifted their eyes across the balcony to a specific teen leaning against the wall further down the room. Harum and Haku were training for Haku's finals match when they saw Naruto come out with Shino. Both stopped their spar instantly, opting to take a break while there were witnesses around. As close as they all were, Haku, Shino and Naruto were still competitors in the finals, which meant that they could very easily end up fighting each other. The two boys simply walked over to the training area and tested a few seals. Some had obvious results while others were not so easily identified, either way Shino seemed to accept the results as Naruto handed him a scroll. When the two made to go back inside though Haku called out to them. Hold on Shino, we need to talk to you. No Naruto, you can go back inside. She had to hold in a laugh at the range of expressions surrounding her. Naruto looked confused, but accepted his fate with a shrug. Shino looked intrigued as he walked over to the two girls. Harum on the other hand looked slightly horrified as her wide eyes glanced between Haku and Shino. Finally she decided that speaking to the instigator was the best course of action, so she turned to Haku and whispered sharply. You aren't seriously going to do that now are you? Haku just grinned and nodded in response. No, you can't. I'm not ready yet. Besides we've been training and I'm all sweaty, you can't ask him now, it'll be embarrassing. She pleaded. Ask me what Harum san. Shino's even response was enough to send the poor girl a couple feet off the ground in surprise. Um, we just wanted to know if, if you wanted to help us train. Yeah, that's it. We wanted to know if you would help us train right Haku. Harum prayed that the ice user would save her from humiliation just this one but when she saw the glint in the girl's eye she knew it was too late. 
It was her own fault though. She'd called in too many favors in already since asking Haku to help her with this little issue it seemed. Shino-san. Harum-chan wants to know if. Haku had to dodge a bit as Harum suddenly got a second win for their spar. Don't you dare Haku. If you don't tell him then I'm going to. I'm not ready. Harum pleaded. You're never ready. You had better get ready soon or someone else will be. Haku scolded her just before landing a heel in her opponent's gut. Harum fell to her knees, grasping her stomach gritting her teeth in equal amounts pain, humiliation and aggravation. She knew Haku was telling the truth. Despite the other girl's worldly experience Haku had vowed to not waste her second lease on life. She choked back the sobs that wanted to show her frustration before standing. Clenching her fists she scowled at her friend before turning to Shino. Shino. Would you like to? She clenched her eyes shut and took a deep breath she bowed low to the boy. Would you like to go on a date sometime? Quote dot 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 quote. Quote dot 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 quote. Harum chanced a glance up to find Shino looking over at Haku before slowly turning his head back to her. That would be, acceptable. I will let you know when. So few words, then he turned and left. Harum wanted to cry. Just acceptable. Congratulations Harum Chan. I think he likes you too. Haku was grinning like mad from the scene. What do you mean? He said it was acceptable. What kind of answer is that? Well, going by the blush he had, I'd say a good one. Come on. Haku grabbed her hand and pulled her towards the house. Where are we going? Don't you have to train? No offense Harum Chan, but you dress like a boy. We're going to get you some real clothes for when you go on your date. It was the straight truth. Harum, while decent looking, never flaunted what she had. The term, tomboy, often came up when people would describe her. She wasn't against getting dirty, and she'd done more than her fair share of hard work. Because of those tendencies she often wore regular ninja pants and whatever comfortable shirt was available when she got dressed. Just like her clothes, her hair was never stylish, or even particularly tended to at all. It was a little too short in the back to put into a ponytail, but long enough in the front to frame her face. Two red-colored bangs came in front of her ears, just barely keeping her vision free while the rest was teared down and kept her natural black from the crown of her head where it was at least three inches, to the nape of her neck where it was trimmed to almost skin level. AD Date, with Shino Kun. The whole event seemed to hit her at that moment and shortly after her smile was matching Haku's as they switched positions. It was now Harum who was pulling Haku through the house as the latter called out for Naruto to come open the gate for them. Asterisk 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 and flashback asterisk asterisk. Finishing his rounds in the office, Naruto debated a moment before heading to the hidden basement and picking up the one item that he decided would only be shown at the right time. That time was coming up soon, he could feel it. It wasn't quite here yet though so instead of wearing his mother's sword he sealed it into another scroll all by itself and stored it in the pocket closest to his heart. This way it was in a place of comfort, close enough to reach easily if needed and in a place he was sure to guard well since it was a vital point. While he was down there he also replaced the two scrolls he had been training from this past month in addition to his training with Jiraiya and all of the other tasks he put on his own shoulders. It was a busy month for sure but it would all pay off soon. Resealing the room he made his way back up and out of his office to find the girls now up and quietly eating breakfast. Good morning everyone, he said cheerily, getting groans in response from the girls who had just recently woken up. They looked at him and saw that he wasn't dressed to impress today. No, there was only one possibility for his attire. Naruto was ready for war. They had heard of the possible invasion and they too worked hard to get stronger with Naruto giving them quick pointers on how to train to get the most out of their month when he was able to. None of them slacked off knowing that one more minute, one more second of training could mean the difference between life and death in the coming fights. Naruto-kun how can you get up so early? You were up later than us last night and we know you were training. Haku half glared at his too cheery for the morning attitude. I'm used to not getting much sleep. I guess it's just another one of my talents to go with the high stamina and chakra. He flinched as he mentioned the last part. Every time he mentioned his stamina he could practically sense them drooling in their heads, often bringing back memories of their looks the night he relapsed. 
Thankfully they never acted on their dreams since then, so he didn't get sent back to the hospital from more mental trauma. Naruto-sama if you keep teasing us like that, Yan, you're going to regret it. Kin's threat was hardly a threat at all as she lazily waved her cereal spoon at him causing him to snicker a little at her effort. Hanada just finished her cereal and put her dish in the sink before giving Naruto a quick kiss and heading to her room. She didn't need to be up so early since she wasn't in the finals, but that didn't mean she wasn't going to see her boyfriend before he left. Of course asking for more than a kiss was pretty much out of the question judging from the the fact that she looked like she was about to fall asleep standing. Make sure to cheer loud for us Hanada-chan. Naruto called after her, getting a groan in response causing Naruto to laugh again and the other two girls to giggle as well. Once the girls were finished they went to their room as well to prepare while Naruto ate. Since Kin was staying with them she opted to sleep in Haku's room allowing Hinata her privacy which she gladly accepted, being less accepting of female to female interaction even if it was just sleeping in the same bed. After Naruto finished they were on their way. He no longer had to worry about locking the gate on the way out. It had been one of his projects during the break. It could now be opened from the inside by the girls, so they could leave anytime. He hadn't done anything outside yet, as he wasn't sure how to go about making sure that they wouldn't get extorted by anyone trying to get in. That meant getting in required that someone inside had to open the gate for them or Naruto had to open it for them. This usually wasn't an issue since Naruto often left a clone around to alert him in case guests showed up. Another key seal that was planned out was one to check for genjutsu by having the user pulse chakra through it which then pulsed through the air to disrupt the jutsu enough to confirm its presence. This had caught a few ninja already attempting to use a henge to trick those inside into thinking they were a friend. Most of them just went on their way a little angrier than when they came, often throwing out a few insults before leaving. Others just didn't learn and tried to hop over. Those of course were detained and sent to have a one-on-one -on -one with an interrogator. That made Ibiki and Anko happy as they got to sharpen their skills, and test out some of Naruto's bag of tricks that he had lent to them after his run-in with Ibiki. Most of its contents they absolutely loved since they caused minimum bodily harm but wrought a huge amount of pain. Basically meaning they could interrogate high-profile prisoners while leaving little proof of their actions behind. That's not to say that every method the blonde had was new to them, but there were a few items that they had to admit were, inventive. The three went through town hand in hand in hand as they weaved through the crowd being in no rush to get to their destination. After a while though it got a little tiring getting bumped around and having to apologize so often when they did the bumping, so they took to the roofs and ended up getting to the grand stadium quite a bit before they needed to, tough they weren't alone. They considered the other contenders as a warning explosion went off overhead. Five minutes until the start. The stands, which weren't yet filled, would be standing room only soon. None of that really got their attention though. It was the other contestants that were standing there watching them in turn that put them on edge. Tamari, Konkuro and Gara were woken at sunrise by their sensei. They knew the drill and they would be the first ones in the stadium as per their plan. They wanted ample time to study their opponents after all since they hadn't seen most of them for a month. Konkuro had made it habit at this point to sleep in the same room as Tamari since their sensei, Baki, was getting on all of their nerves. It was clear he had his own agenda while he was here, out of the eyes of the Suna Council and the Case Cage. He had tried numerous times to catch the girl alone. From the shower, which after the first time he walked in on her she stuck to the public bathhouse and only when others were in as well. Not that she needed to worry since her scream brought Gara into the picture quickly. Baki learned quickly not to follow her into the bathhouse after a few beatings of a severity normally only reserved for a certain Sani. During the night when Konkuro was, asleep, he found that Karasu could still be dangerous when he pinned Tamari to the bed during the night to find that her arms sprouted blades. Unfortunately he didn't get any permanent injuries from the event, but he stayed away from the room long enough for them to secure it to the point that it would alert them instantly if he tried that again. He even tried following her into the bathroom a few times, earning everything from the door slammed in his face to a mule kick to the groin. The chances he got were few and those that he did get were ruined, so he was in an understandably, if misguided, foul mood. You two go on ahead. 
I need to discuss something with Tamari before she leaves. A little tip I found out about her opponent. A sad excuse and he cursed when Konkuro came back in the room and sat down obviously not buying it. Tamari smiled at her sensei. Damn it I want to talk to her alone. Forget it you pervert. I'm not leaving you alone with my sister you damn pedophile. Now you can either tell her this tip or let us leave. Of course there's always the other thing you have in mind, but I'm betting the Konoha Anbu would be here in seconds if I shot an explosive ball out the window. To illustrate his point he had one of his puppet's arms wiggle out of the bindings and point towards the window. T-C-H. Forget the tip you can lose to that punk for all I care. Now get out of my sight and don't forget the plan. A red-faced Baki went into his room to prepare, slamming the door behind him. Tamari sighed. Thanks again Konkuro. No problem nay san. Let's go. They left the room and sped downstairs to catch up to Gara before he had a chance to go out of control in the crowd. He had been a bit more unstable since the preliminaries and they didn't want him to get too far out of their sights. Konkuro leaned over to his brother a bit. Just remember the plan Gara. Once the attack starts you can have all the blood you want. The comment caused the boy to smile and lick his lips while the action in turn made Tamari and Konkuro very nervous. Distancing themselves from the boy a little more they made their way to the stadium. There weren't too many people around this early other than those setting up their stands for the day, but those that were on the street gave the three a wide berth as they felt the aura rolling off the redhead. As they expected they were the first to arrive so they simply took up places around the waiting room. Sakura never went to sleep the night before. It wasn't because she was nervous, well she was a little bit nervous because she would have to impress her Sasuke-kun, but that wasn't what kept her up. No, she stayed up to run through any possible strategy she could think of to beat her opponent. She had spent so much time trying to find the raven-haired boy, who seemed to have disappeared even though she knew they wouldn't keep a finals contestant from participating just for trying to get what should have been given to him. Would they? She couldn't be sure of much anymore because her main boat of confidence was also nowhere to be seen. Ever since those Anbu took her mother she hadn't seen her or heard anything about her. Whenever she asked about her all she got was a disgusted look and a cold shoulder. Even the Hokage just avoided the question, telling her that it wasn't her issue to worry about and she should be concentrating on the exams. She had seen her opponent fight though and knew the girl was hanging out with Naruto Baka now so clearly she would be no threat, but it never hurt to be prepared for future opponents. This is what she had been working on for the past day and night. How to get around each of her opponent's defenses and obliterate them. The only thing she didn't take into account were her own skills since she spent too much time daydreaming about the Uchiha even when she was being serious. Looking at her clock she realized it was time to show those weaklings who was superior. Grabbing her supplies she headed out the door, not even bothering with breakfast. She didn't want to put on any weight in case Sasuke-kun looked at her. It was difficult to make her way to the stadium. She was so light that the crowd easily jostled her around the street. Often making her go in the opposite direction she had wanted to go. When she tried to order the people to move out of her way most just ignored her. Others scoffed and turned away. She didn't know what their problem was so she just did her best to get through and managed to make it to the stadium earlier than she needed to be. The only other people in the stadium when she got there were the Suna team and some of the audience. Neji showed his calm and collected exterior as he walked down the streets of Konoha. Inside though he was furious. He had done a little research into his opponent and found out about his academy life. He tried to find more about his missions and current training, but like the rest of the ninja's data should have been, Naruto's files were restricted. Moreover the kid seemed to like his privacy a bit more than most would think was healthy. Even when he did emerge from his house his destination was another restricted area. The council room, Hokage's office or he would simply disappear around a corner and seem to vanish before Neji could catch up. He would have used his Byakugan, but during exam time its use was forbidden from him as all training during this time was meant to be done in secret and advantages like the Byakugan used for spying were prohibited. Of course if the target chose to train out in the open that was their fault. The same rules would apply to the Abarame bugs, the Uchiha Sharingan and even the Yamanaka mind jutsu had one made it to the finals. 
It was infuriating to him to know that he knew nothing about his opponent. Hanada was easy since he had grown up around her and she was well known as being the heir to the clan. Her skills were also well known, but as soon as she had left his view that was no longer the case. Judging from her skill increase in the preliminary match she had gained more strength in the time she was out of the compound than she had acquired over years of training inside. Then there was that style she used. Not quite Jukin, but not quite different either. Logically she shouldn't have given him such trouble. She shouldn't even have gotten up from his first strike, hell she shouldn't even have lasted long enough for that first strike. She was getting strong, fast and he had no idea how other than that she was staying with that boy, but that couldn't be why. He was the dead last of his class. He had only graduated because of a fluke that no one had any knowledge of. No, she had found some way to become stronger that no one else knew of. His opponent though was a complete enigma past his academy days, and that irritated him. Plus him using only taijutsu in his preliminary match didn't give any hints either, but in the end it wouldn't matter. Fate would prove him the victor today. A dead last had no hope against a prodigy. Instead he concentrated on his true opponents. Uchiha Sasuke the last of the Uchiha clan and Sabaku no Gara, the boy who defeated his teammate Lee and could have very possibly ended the boy's ninja career. The Uchiha was arrogant, but based on what he saw in the forest the boy was strong when those strange marks showed up. Had he not been so foolish he would have stuck around to watch the rest that happened, but after seeing Sasuke fight he had all the information he really cared about on those present at the time. Gara, on the other hand had a defense much like Neji's own. He smirked at the thought of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Keisuke's son and showing the stuck-up main branch just how strong he was. It was at this point he realized that he had made it to the stadium, so he went to the waiting room and sat down. Not caring who was already there since fate had already predetermined that they would lose to him. Dosu was upset. First Kin gets taken by that blonde prick and isn't seen or heard from at all, except for her easy win in the preliminaries. Then Zaku died after failing his match. Now he was all alone and the previous night he had a visitor telling him that Orochimaru wanted him to drop out of the exam for the greater good of their main goal. He was too pissed though and ignored the order, telling the messenger that he could go get his ass pounded by their cage for all he cared. The messenger of course didn't take it well, but there was little the man could do after the door was slammed in his face. Now Dosu just finished strapping on his weapon before heading out into the village. He had no time for the trinkets and treats of the pathetic civilian stands and simply headed right for the stadium, pushing his way through the crowd. He came to the waiting room, took note that there was still no kin there, then went to a corner to sit down ignoring the glares he got from his opponents. Shikamaru wished he could have just slept in, but he'd already pushed it too far and his mother came in and more or less beat him out of his futon. All the while she yelled about the cursed lazy jeans in the male Nara and how he needed to find a girlfriend who would set him straight. Checking his gear once more he slipped out of the house before his mom could send another volley of shouts, or worse, household objects at him. Sighing he walked through the streets towards the stadium. He only stopped once to pick up a little breakfast before moving on. He was far from stupid. The second he was out of his house he knew his parents were following him, well his dad would be getting dragged along while his mom followed him. If they managed to catch up to him then he would be in for another round of scolding. Keeping his steady pace he soon entered the stadium just as the warning went off. He simply dismissed it and ignoring those glancing at him on his way and he just leaned against a wall and closed his eyes to wait. In the Abarame compound Shino was already up and talking to his hive as he ate his breakfast. Even after his parents came in no one spoke a word. When he finished he stood up and headed for the door. As he was turning the knob, two insects flew out in front of him. He nodded to them and went on his way. It's not that his parents didn't like talking to him, that was just their way. The fact that they had sent insects to him so early in the morning was enough for him to know that they were wishing him luck. Unlike his peers the boy headed straight for the roofs, taking the path that would be the quietest as he hopped towards the stadium. He heard the warning sound for everyone to head that way and hurried along, lest he be caught in the crowd when he needed to be in the waiting room. For a ninja though, this was still an easy task, 
so upon arriving at the stadium he simply blended with the crowd and cut off into the waiting room where the rest of the contestants were. Sasuke heard the warning go off, but he was far from finished training. As soon as he was let out of his cell by the bandaged man he often saw with the two advisors he immediately went to his sensei and demanded he be taught until the finals. Kakashi had initially refused, but after hours of nagging he caved and told the boy that if he didn't stop his bitching that he would slam a chidori through his head. For emphasis he created one of the crackling balls of chakra and slammed it into a nearby tree. Immediately after he realized his mistake as he shot his eyes to the Uchiha to see the boy grinning with his Sharingan ablaze. He knew then that he was trapped. He had to teach the boy how to wield the jutsu properly or it would kill him which of course would have caused a witch hunt to find the Cyclopean ninja as most of the village revered the Uchiha for his eyes. Neither knew of the council's arrest yet since they had left shortly before the civilian council was taken into custody. Resigned to his fate, Kakashi reluctantly trained the boy and taught him his limits for Chidori. Which of course the boy foolishly tried to surpass and ended up suffering from chakra exhaustion and crying about Kakashi needing to find a way for the jutsu to use less chakra. Today though Kakashi had heard the warning as well, but really didn't want to take the boy to the stadium, and it was apparent the boy was in no hurry to go either. With any luck they would miss the exam completely and the Uchiha would be disqualified. Sasuke had no such worries though since he knew he couldn't get disqualified. Hell he could probably get his two guardians to just hand him the Chunin promotion if he wanted, but right now he had a different goal. He wanted to get back at Naruto for all of the humiliation the Dobi had caused him. He had been dreaming for weeks now of how he would shove the lightning blade through the boy in various ways as all the world stood in awe of his power, then afterward breeding himself an Uchiha army and taking over the village before going out to slaughter his brother. Such mad dreams, but it drove him to train until the last possible minute. The proctor for the final portion of the exams entered the room, causing all heads to turn towards him. He took in the combatants around him as they returned his gaze. I am Shiranui Genma. I will be your proctor for this portion of the exams. The rules from the preliminary matches still apply here so no screwing around like you did there. I am not as lenient as Hayate was. Sir where is the other proctor? Kin asked. He was unable to come today, so I am the proctor. That is all you need to know. Now, follow me into the arena so we may present you to those you will be entertaining. As the ninja made their way out of the room Kin's arm was grabbed by Dosu. Where the hell have you been slut? We had orders to stay at the hotel. He was forced to let go though as a hand gripped his own shoulder and clamped down, hard. I don't think she likes your filthy hands on her mummy san. I suggest you move along before I decide to christen this arena with your blood. I'm sure the crowd would love the exhibition, though I would hate to take Haku-chan's opponent away. I think she was looking forward to filling you full of holes. Her and Kin Chan have gotten to be good friends after all. Naruto narrowed his eyes at Dosu, who in turn met his gaze for a bit before shaking his arm free. It matters not. I'll simply deal with her in the finals, along with you. The bandaged Genin stalked off after the others, intent on following his own rules not. After all, in Odo it's the strong that make the rules. Thank you Naruto-sama. Kin leaned over and kissed him before they followed the rest. Anytime Kin Chan. The stadium was packed, more than packed, people were standing on the steps and in the upper walkways to see the young ninja that would soon be fighting for their promotions. As the Hokage welcomed the contestants and the audience, notable people were shifting anxiously in their seats. As this was an international event, the issues with the counselors and the Uchiha were kept top secret so as to not make the village look weak to the public eye. Instead their seats were occupied by some of those who had made it through the forest but lost in the preliminaries. Quite an honor for them since it put them right next to where the numerous daimyo sat. Those from Konoha looked towards their friends with admiration, jealousy and in at least one case hatred. Upon discovering the seating arrangement, Kiba had rushed to the stadium that morning as fast as he was able to in order to get a seat next to Hinata, but she hadn't come until later. When she did finally show she was with Ino, Choji and Tenten whom casually surrounded her when they saw him there. They could see the desire that was still in his eyes, 
but they could also see his numerous bandages and the splint on one of his legs not to mention some other minor cuts and bruises around his exposed skin. The jacket he normally wore no longer existed, so he had arrived in a normal, short-sleeved shirt leaving his arms exposed. Kiba-san, are you okay? Those injuries didn't come from your match with Naruto. They're too new. Choji ended up sitting next to the boy by silent agreement, but didn't mind since he didn't really have much against the mutt, and tried to start a friendly conversation. Asterisk 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 flashback asterisk asterisk. Kiba came home only a few days after the preliminaries. He was still hurting a bit from what Naruto had done to him, but nothing he couldn't handle. That was all to change in a few seconds as he stepped over the threshold into his house. Instantly he was grabbed by both arms as Akamaru was pulled out of his coat. When he went to yell at his assailants he was met with the cold, hard stares. And barred canines of his fellow clansmen. As dense as he was it didn't take him long to figure out that his retraining was about to begin. If this rough handling wasn't enough of a sign then the visages of his mother and sister as they appeared in the landing more than drove the point home. Bother looked dead serious as they glared down at him. Take him to his new room. Strip him and chain him up. No sooner had the command left Soom's mouth than he was hauled through the house and out to a lone building on the compound grounds. It was so sparingly used that they had a little trouble taking the lock off the door. A small testament to just how severe his actions had been. As the doors opened into the near pitch black room, he paled for the first time since he was grabbed. Not much could scare him but the thought of being in this place, alone, for any long period of time was horrifying. The room itself was fairly large, but to a free-roaming spirit like an Inazuka it might as well have been a bento box. The space wasn't so the detainee could stretch their legs though. No, it was for the real action of the retraining, so those that would be administering his punishment would have room to move around. His area consisted of a five-foot chain attached to a thick metal post that was secured from the floor to the ceiling. The floor, where he would be spending his nights, was bare, uneven rock. Hard, unforgiving granite that held a similar texture to sandpaper. Moving too much on a surface like that would no doubt leave scrapes with ease but the large stains on its surface hinted that the rough surface would be the least of his worries. His attendants once again grabbed him tightly and hauled him over towards the post. Fighting was futile as they now had a few spectators to see his initial humiliation. As soon as he was locked into place they set about unceremoniously tearing his clothing off his body, headless of the memories that may have been lost along with his favorite jacket. The slight chill that came with the darkness was enough to raise goosebumps on his now naked flesh, not that anyone cared. Once the men were finished they took the rags that had once been his ninja gear and strode out of the building, moving aside at the door to allow the next visitors to enter. Kiba now stood defiantly facing his mother and sister. So it begins. Was what I did really so bad to deserve this? Inazuka Kiba, you have disgraced this clan on numerous occasions through selfish actions with only your desires in mind. He was slightly caught off guard when it was his sister that spoke instead of his mother, but quickly took a neutral expression again. This being the case, it has been decided that you are to go through retraining. As the current clan head's son you will be given no leniency until three days before the Chunin exam finals. At that time you will be healed until it is deemed that you are in capable defense form then released on a trial basis. Should the retraining be proven ineffective then the time will be lengthened until you are considered a capable and obedient clan member once again, or you are broken. Hannah's cold tone sent shivers down the boy's spine. It was obvious that she held him fully accountable for his actions, actions that she deemed inappropriate for a human let alone her own brother. Having said her piece, Hannah took a step back in order for their mother to have the full stage. If Hannah's voice sent shivers down his spine, his mother's look made it want to crawl away and hide. Soom sneered down at the boy as though he were an Iwa nin who killed her dog. Until a time when you can realize and repent for your actions, you are no longer my son. You will stay in the compound as part of the clan, but your status as a possible heir is revoked until further noticed, and possible permanently. She turned on her heel and signaled the retraining to begin as more clan members stared to file into the room. Only a few would be in with him at a time, but it wouldn't matter as they had been instructed to use him as they would a training dummy. 
Their only restriction was to keep him alive and still able to do his ninja duties once healed. To help them accomplish that task, a medic nin was stationed with him to heal anything too serious, but was instructed to interfere only when the boy's career or life was in serious danger. As the door closed Kiba gave those about to punish him a smirk, trying to keep up his bravado. Do your worst. As if it was their signal, they did just that. Kiba's cries of pain would ring out randomly through the hours for the next few weeks as he was repeatedly beaten into submission. His howling would strengthen the resolve of many of his clansmen and serve as fuel for the adults to keep their children in line for years to come. Asterisk 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 and flashback asterisk asterisk. Kiba looked at Naruto once again and sneered. It's nothing. Leave me alone. He snapped back. Choji just shrugged and went back to eating his chips. Ino leaned over to Hinata and Tenten to whisper her thoughts. He still hasn't learned his lesson. My god he's dense. Almost as dense as that bitch Sakura. Whom, by the way, is going to get her ass completely handed to her. The three shared to chuckle making Kiba glare at them, but that just made them laugh harder. The foreign ninja from the preliminaries that decided to stick around just looked at them with some confusion, but brushed it off. The Hokage was finishing his speech and had exchanged a few brief words with the case cage, who was sharing the cage box with him, as Genma re-explained the rules just in case someone wasn't listening as well as showing those gathered that they had indeed been informed. Nay, Shiranui-san, Sasuke-kun isn't here yet. Shouldn't we wait until he arrives? Sakura asked the proctor. No, he still has some time left until his match, though showing up a little late will hurt his overall results. If he is too late for his match, then he will be disqualified. The man said as he swished a Sanban around in his mouth. Sakura looked horrified. You can't do that to Sasuke-kun. He is the best ninja here. You have to make him a chunin. Which of you weaklings was his opponent again? Oh yeah you. The Suna guy. If Sasuke-kun doesn't come by your match time you have to forfeit. Gara just looked at her, then looked away. Oh. K. Anyway. The first match will be Uzumaki Naruto against Hayuga Neji. Everyone else go wait into the contenders area until your match is up. Those two I called stay here and we'll get this show on the road. The three waited until everyone was safely off the field then Genma looked toward the Hokage booth and, after receiving a nod, knew it was time to begin. Uzumaki Naruto are you ready? Hayuga Neji are you ready? Each boy nodded in turn as they stood staring each other down. Begin. As Genma jumped away the crowd cheered and the first match of the finals was underway. Uzumaki Naruto. You were the dead last of your class. Every aspect of your ninja career has been hidden and you seem to not even want to leave your house. Are you afraid Uzumaki? You should be. Fate has already determined that I will defeat you just like I defeated that disgrace, Hanada. Come, I'll end this quickly. Neji got into his fighting stance and activated his Byakugan. Naruto just waited until he finished and smirked. The only part that had affected him throughout the speech was when Neji mentioned Hinata. Hayuga Neji. Prodigy of the Hayuga Cadet Branch family. Every aspect of your ninja career was accompanied by that stick up your ass which you don't seem to be ashamed to bring out in public. Are you after Sasuke-chan too? I think you are. Fate is a bunch of bullshit that had nothing to do with your pointless grudge against Hinata-chan. Come. I'll give you one free hit. He matched the boy sentence for sentence, never breaking stride and in the end just stood there without a care in the world. Up in the stands Hiyashi smirked. Foolish boy. No one insults a Hayuga like that and lives. While down with the young ninja watching, four girls were smirking even more than Hiyashi. Neji moved forward cautiously, but saw that Naruto closed his eyes. Without missing a step he rushed forward and landed a few Juken strikes on the blonde's arms and legs, causing him to collapse to the ground with a grunt. Foolish little pest. Did you really think that offering one from my clan a free shot would end in your favor? He looked over his shoulder. Proctor I will leave this call up to you. If you do not call the match I plan on humiliating him, completely. He saw the man smile and mistook it as a go ahead. Turning back to where Naruto was laying he reactivated his eyes just in time to dodge a strike from behind. How? Oh come on. You didn't really think I was sparring all this time with Hinata without learning how to protect myself from your little tricks did you? 
I'll be nice though and not give away that secret here. He looked up towards where the main branch of the Hyuga were sitting. Consider this the only favor I'll ever do for you Hiyashi Tem. Those that knew who the clan head was, were horrified at the honorific the boy gave to the man. Luckily Hiyashi was able to maintain his stoic demeanor, though he did grip his armrests a bit tighter. You dare insult Hiyashi-sama like that. You will pay dearly, failure. Neji rushed back in, but was blocked when several clones popped into existence. He could see behind them where Naruto took up a spot near the wall, leaning against it. Furious, Neji began the rampaging execution of any clones that got in his way as he headed for the boy. Everything from Jukan strikes to jumping roundhouse kicks were used against those close enough, while Kanai were thrown seemingly haphazardly around and into clones farther away. All this time his main focus was on the blonde at the wall. So that Uzumaki boy can use cage bunshin. That's pretty good for someone his age, and being fresh out of the academy. Maybe this match isn't as simple as we thought Katetsu. Yeah Zumo, but that Hyuga is making quick work of them. It doesn't matter how many clones the brat makes, if they can't land a hit they're pointless. Cage Bunshin isn't exactly a basic jutsu either. It uses a lot of chakra, so if this keeps up Uzumaki will just fall over from exhaustion. True but he doesn't even look like he's breathing hard after all of those. Neji finally broke through the line of foes and sprinted towards the wall where Naruto stood calmly looking at the sky. It's over. He extended his arm and hit his palm dead center on Naruto's chest causing the boy's eyes to go wide as he coughed. This is why you will never beat me. No wonder you were dead last. You can't even pay attention when your life is on the line. Now you will pay the price. Neji drew his arm back again, intent on smashing another strike into his head and end the disgrace for good. He got as far as his own ear before he heard Naruto chuckle. Laughing at the end, just like the joke your life has been. Hi, hee hee, my life is a complete joke, says this. Bunshin Devakua, a flash of blue, then an explosion rocked the stadium and a large cloud of smoke obscured the two fighters. All around the stadium people were trying to see what happened, but were rewarded when the smoke cleared only to show an unharmed Neji standing in a crater with another, larger crater where Naruto once stood. Clap clap clap. Neji spun on his heel to see Naruto standing right in the center of the stadium, completely unharmed. You survived. I'm impressed. With a motion of his hand Neji was once again surrounded by clones. This time though they didn't wait for him to come to them. They charged him. Dot all at once. Kanai slashed through the air and headed toward the young prodigy. With so many coming he was going to be hard pressed to deflect them all, unless. Hakusho Kaden. Another burst of blue chakra flashed and now everyone was able to see just how the Hyuga had survived the explosion. Every Naruto that was attacking was sent flying back before dispelling. This left Neji and Naruto staring at each other just like they had been in the beginning. Hiyashi was now flopped back in his seat in disbelief. He knows Kaden. How? That is only taught to the main branch. Even Hanabi doesn't know it yet, and I definitely didn't teach it to that weak little traitor Hinata. Did he learn it on his own? Unbelievable. Now I know why the village considers him a prodigy. I have to make sure he stays loyal to the Hyuga at all cost. I suppose it's time to give him his father's letter. So that. S how you survived. Nice trick but it won't do much if you can't get near your opponent, and so far the only hit you've gotten on me was the one I gave to you. Do you have anything to say? Naruto said as he walked towards Neji. Quote dot dot dot. You were within my divination. Neji took up a new stance, confusing Naruto, but completely shocking the Hyuga in the stance. Not possible. Hiyashi whispered, confusing his youngest, and now only, daughter. Hanada was also wide-eyed that her cousin knew such a technique, and when asked what was going on she suddenly began to cry a little. No. Naruto-kun. Hake Rokujuyan show. Before Naruto could react, Neji was in his guard and pounding away at his body. A sadistic grin crossed his face as each hit connected, proving that this was no mere bunshin. When the beating was finished Naruto was shot backwards from the force of the final strikes. Once more Neji turned to the proctor but this time kept his Byakugan active to ensure Naruto wouldn't get up. Examiner. It's over. Genma looked from the boy to his downed opponent and smiled again. 
struggling. Naruto hoisted himself to a sitting position. What? You're running away. This was just starting to get fun. With a bit more difficulty he rose to his feet, swaying a little from the strain and spitting some blood out of his mouth. You should have stayed down Uzumaki. Examiner. I plan to kill him. Stop me when you wish. Neji's veins thickened as he pumped more chakra to his eyes in his anger. Blah, blah, blah. You talk as though you're actually going to beat me. Don't waste my time. All of your tenkatsu are closed. You have no more access to your chakra in order to fight with. I don't. Naruto started making hand signs, which would have made Neji nervous if he wasn't able to see that there was no chakra response. As Naruto tried to activate the jutsu nothing happened. He wiggled his hand a little acting like something might slip out if he tried to force it. Huh. What do y'all know? You were right. Well that could be a problem. You see it is hopeless. We are all bound by a fate that we have no control over. Your fate, is to lose to me. Well I'll just have to change that fate then. It doesn't seem to go well with my plans. Naruto relied casually. Change fate. Neji scoffed. As if such a thing were possible. You don't know what you are talking about because you've never had to care about such a thing. Those of us that have proof of fate, know better. Neji removed his Hitai ITE and showed off the seal on his forehead. Ah the infamous caged bird seal. Yeah, I hear it has all kinds of nasty little tricks in it. Like how the head family can torture you or kill you just by activating that seal. Man that must suck to live every day of you life wondering if the family you serve might decide you did something wrong and hurt you for it. Of course I'm sure they'd only kill you if you did something really wrong. So sad. Tough luck. Get over it. Naruto grinned at the Hyuga across from him whose eyes were now nearly bloodshot from rage. As if you're the only one in the world with such a burden. Maybe if you looked outside your own ego you'd see that others are suffering too, sometimes from fates, far worse. You know what they do. They get on with their lives. Naruto got into a fighting stance and it looked to the crowd like he was trying to mold chakra again. Inside Naruto's head he knew he was in a tight spot. The only way he could open his tenkatsu before was from channeling chakra from a different part of his body to the damaged area. With no access to chakra at all it would be impossible. That was when he remembered one of the things Jiraiya had made him learn to do. Delving deep inside his subconscious he contacted the only help he could. Fox, if you can still hear me, I could use a little help out here. Why do you try so hard? I already told you that is pointless. Your tenkatsu are dead and won't open for another. His words died in his mouth and he watched as a new chakra seemed to begin to spin in Naruto's gut. The reddish chakra began to spread throughout Naruto's system and it didn't take a genius or a prodigy to see that the tenkatsu were popping back open. Because, you hurt one of my precious people, and you called me a failure. With a burst of orange, chakra exploded from Naruto but quickly regressed back into him. With a little help I can open up my tenkatsu again, and now that that's done. Naruto drew his katana causing a few cries from the stand some of which came from the preliminary eliminations area. Karata, Taniguchi and Higoshi, who was allowed to sit with his teammates since there was room available were out of their seats in an instant, knowing exactly whose sword Naruto held. That sword belonged to Kafu. How the hell did he get it? Kiba answered reluctantly, since he heard the most about it. He killed some Kiri missing Nin on his way to a mission. He may have been willing to give away that Naruto killed the guy, but he'd be damned if he was going to say that it was on the way to help Team 7. And no way. Kafu was a Jonin. No Jenin could beat him. Karata looked back at the blonde holding the black blade. Kafu was good enough to be in the Seven Swordsmen, and make them eight. The only reason he wasn't was because they tried to overthrow the Mazukage before he could join their ranks. That sword is one of the strongest I know of, and is actually the exact opposite of one of the swords of another of the swordsmen. If he finds out how to use that thing he's going to be a force to be reckoned with. Karata said before the three Kiri Nin looked at each other and nodded. In a flash they were gone from the booth and out in the stadium. Stop right there you three. Genma called, but they just headed straight for their target. Unfortunately they were only able to get about as close as Neji before they were heard and Naruto changed his facing to put all of them within his view. Oh, hello. Um, 
can I help you? Naruto looked genuinely surprised to see them there. We've come to reclaim the rightful property of Karigakur no Sato. Give us that blade or we will be forced to take it via any means necessary. They begun to advance when four Anbu dropped down and surrounded Naruto, facing away from him. A bit of an unusual situation for him, all things considered. Naruto looked up to the cage's box and saw the Hokage shouting something at his attendant who nodded and started barking orders into his headset. It kind of irritated him though. Nay. Anbu san. I kind of have a match going on right now, so could you please leave? He tried to be as polite as he could. Uzumaki san. Hokage sama has ordered us to keep you safe from this attack. Ninja of Kiri. Go back to the stands or we will be forced to detain you all. It is in direct violation of the rules of the exam for anyone to be on the field except for the competitors and the proctor. The Anbu leader watched as the three Kiri Nin seemed to be weighing their options. Nay, Anbu San. Naruto walked right up beside the man with his hands casually behind his head. Aren't you violating that rule by being here too? He looked up to the Hokage with a smile and a wink, then watched as the old man hesitated before speaking to his attendant again who in turn looked shocked and tried to argue but at a stern look from Sarutobi relayed his orders. The Anbu on the field shot their heads up to the man who in turn nodded. Glancing once more at the Kiri Nin, then to Naruto the head Anbu sighed. Very well Uzumaki-san. Then in a softer whisper that he thought the boy couldn't hear, you're going to regret this when you're all diced up demon. Oh you don't have to be so worried about me Anbu-san. Now scurry home. Naruto made shooing motions, once again shocking the crowd at his lack of respect. The lead Anbu glared at him, but shunned away before he did something he would regret, forcing his team to follow his lead. Now where were we? Oh yeah. Sorry to keep you waiting Neji-san, but now we can get serious. He got into a fighting stance. You plan to fight all of us. You're very brave Naruto-san. Stupid. But brave. Now. Now. Taniguchi-san was it. No need for insults. I'm just trying to make the fight a bit more fair. You three are on Neji's team so feel free to attack me as you please. Four genin against me should balance the scales a bit more. The three didn't need any more of an invitation as they sped in. Neji on the other hand was a bit confused, but decided to wait it out. Either way seemed like a win-win situation to him, so he just moved away from the fight and began to recover his strength. The first to reach Naruto was Taniguchi who attempted to go for a leg sweep, which Naruto just jumped over, then to a rising kick to Naruto's chin. Again Naruto just dodged out of the way before throwing out a taunt. Is that the best you've got? He slashed his sword over his shoulder just in time to hear the telltale clang of metal on metal. He turned his head just enough to look into Higoshi's eyes. If you aren't silent enough, then anyone can stop you. He quickly jumped out of the way with the two nin following suit as three balls of water splashed down where he had once been. Attacking while I'm occupied, now that's more like it. There's only one problem though. You forgot what I can do. In an instant there were three more Naruto's. Each facing one of the ninja. Ha. These will be easily defeated. Come on guys let's blow through em. Karata began another jutsu while their two close combat specialists readied their weapons and charged in. Noise and pain was all they got for their hard work. Despite the fact that they were only up against clones, they miscalculated Naruto's strength. Unlike them he had made it to the finals, hardly breaking a sweat to do so considering how much he limited himself in his match against Kiba. Meanwhile they got sent packing in the preliminaries easily, one of them not even strong enough to be in those fights. Taniguchi was the first casualty as he flew right past Karata faster than he had ran in. It surprised her enough to throw her off balance and miss with her new volley of water orbs which gave the clone she fought plenty of time to use her own jutsu against her. Sweden. Tepidama. The orbs hit her dead on and she joined her teammate on the ground. Higoshi growled. You're going to pay for that, bastard. He whipped out a pair of tonfa and rushed in. Out of the three this was the only one that Naruto wasn't sure about, so he just readied his sword and stood waiting for whatever came. A blur of steel on steel ensued as the two exchanged blows. Unlike his teammates, Higoshi was actually rather good with his specialty. He began to push the clone back with his ferocious strike, getting excited that he was winning. 
Perhaps if you knew how to use that sword you would be able to beat me. The clone looked at him like he was stupid. I'm just a clone dumbass. That means this sword is a clone too. Even if I did know how to use it, that would be pointless information since its traits aren't copied. All it is with me is a piece of sharp metal. The traps that the boss set up though are another story. Dot dot quote. By the time Higoshi realized what the clone said it was too late. With one more step a net shot out of the ground and wrapped itself tightly around him. And that is why you are a dumbass, dumbass. The clone kicked the Tanfa away from Higoshi and dragged him over to his now-bound teammates. Just sit around for a bit. Maybe you'll learn something. With that the clone dispelled itself along with the other two. At the sound of the clones dispersing Neji looked up to find Naruto standing, once again, in the middle of the stadium. He walked up to the boy who seemed to be meditating without a care in the world. Activating his Byakugan he confirmed that Naruto's chakra was indeed in a state of rest. Neji, if you're going to stare so hard, people are going to start wondering about you. Neji jumped back into his fighting stance. So you were just playing possum? No, I just thought a little relaxation would help. I actually fell asleep for a second there, but my clone's dispelling woke me up. Those Kiri Nin were kind of weak, huh? Naruto stood and started going through some hand signs as some growling was heard from his bound captives. Sorry loser, but you won't be able to do that. Once again you are within my divination. Hake Rokujuyan show. Neji smirked but it faded as he saw Naruto complete his jutsu. Necessity overcame thought though and he dashed forward. Sorry Neji-san, but that won't work a second time. Dot dot. Tenrai Kagami. Naruto calmly settled into the same stance as Neji and to everyone's amazement, and Hiyashi's utter fury, began to do the exact same moves as Neji. Palm for palm, poke for poke, every strike was cancelled out by an equal force meeting it. The most infuriating part of it all for Neji was that the entire time Naruto's eyes were shut. When the 64th strike hit both boys never moved. Their fingers were touching each other mid-strike but neither gave a sign that they had another move planned. At least not until Naruto opened his eyes. That damn demon has gone too far. How dare he copy the Jukan. I'll have his head on a plate by morning if it's the last thing I do. The poor armrests of Hiyashi's chair were now little more than splinters from his powerful grip. Hanabi watched her father closely, taking in his obvious hatred for the blonde that looked to be easily beating her cousin. He's stronger than Nisan. Sorry Neji, your attack will not work on me. Now how about you forfeit and save yourself some embarrassment? Or you could stay and I can see if I can pull that stick out for you. Naruto at his best, stood taunting someone else in front of everyone. How did you know the Rokujuyan show? That is a Hyuga main branch technique. Neji was seething almost as much as Hiyashi, though for a very different reason. His hatred stemmed from being so easily handled by someone he thought was a talentless runt. Hiyashi-sama will have you executed for stealing clan secrets. Naruto took a step back in mock shock. I would never. Before Neji could call him a liar he was right back in the game. That jutsu I used is one of a kind. My own little creation. I'll give you a little tip on it though. It's best if used against only one opponent, and only if I have more chakra than them. He grinned at the Hyuga. Now let's end this. Naruto readied his sword and rushed in while Neji hurriedly pulled a kunai out of his pouch. Don't worry Neji, when I become powerful enough I'll wipe that seal of yours away, just like Hanada-chan wanted to do when she became clan head. A simple statement, but the shock from it was evident. Neji froze on the spot. Hanada wanted to free us. He came back to reality though when Genma called out. Winner Uzumaki Naruto. Neji stood there now with a blade lined up at his throat and Naruto now behind him. He looked over his shoulder with hatred in his eyes at the blonde. You, tricked me. No, I never once lied. Hanada did want to remove the seals. She wanted one big happy family, not one of half slaves. It hurt her every time her father made her use one of the cadet branch members for anything. Why do you think she learned to do most of her own chores herself? Neji couldn't deny that, it was well known among the cadet branch members that Hanada was the only main branch member that would do her own cooking and cleaning at times. 
She would never let one of them dress her unless it was for a very formal occasion and the dress was something she couldn't physically do herself. She was by far the most independent of the main branch Hyuga. He stayed silent for a while, even after Naruto had lowered his sword. Then took a quick look over to the preliminary fighter's area. He saw Hinata looking directly at him with a gentle smile on her face. It was the same one she always tried to give to the cadet branch members, but also the same one she gave to her few friends as well. Perhaps, perhaps fate was against me today. No, I was against you today. Fate is just the coward's way of not facing life. There are things that we cannot avoid, like who our family is, where we are born, what wars we get involved in. Dot but those are because of other people's choices. We are allowed to make our own choices for everything else in our lives though. Who we love, what our occupation is or how strong we want to become. If you two are done now, we have more matches to get started. Genma said casually, though internally he was more than impressed with the blonde's actions. He showed strength, speed, intelligence and knowledge of his own strengths and weaknesses. Then there was his obvious leadership from how he handled the Anbu. Sure, he had looked like a nervous little kid, but any ninja could see the determination in his eyes. Then taking on three, well technically four, opponents at once and coming out fine was astonishing for a genin even if he was a little scuffed up from Neji's one successful attack. So far they had one, very good, Chunin candidate. The only slip he made was against the first Rokujuyan show, but he showed a great, and possibly the only way to counter it. Hey, hey sorry Shiranui-san. Naruto scratched his head and started to head off the arena floor soon followed by Neji who was still deep in thought, but stopped when he remembered something. Oi Genma-san, you might want some Anbu to clear out those three, he pointed over to the three Kiri Nin who were still trying in vain to get free of their bonds. They don't need a cell, just boot them out of the stadium. After Genma nodded his head he once again ran for the competitor's box. As soon as they entered the box, Naruto was glomped by two people. Naruto-sama that was amazing. You took out four people like it was nothing. Kin said from his right. Yeah that was impressive, but I'm betting you could have done it faster. Haku added from his left. Naruto just laughed a little as he winced from his injuries. Come on girls, show some respect. Neji fought very well too. To the Hyuga's surprise both girls detached from Naruto and come over to him. Good job Neji-san. You put up a good fight. Had it been someone other than Naruto-kun you probably would have kicked their ass. Now it was Neji's turn to be embarrassed. Um. Th thank you. Ha. As if anyone could do better than Sasuke-kun. Just wait till he gets here. He'll make what you did look like an academy taijutsu lesson, and you'll once again be dead last. Sakura snorted. Naruto had to grab his two girlfriends before they made any sudden decisions that would end in Sakura being thrown out of the box. Haku don't take Kin's fight away from her. Kin, save it for the stadium. Ha, as if some Odo Nin reject could beat a Haruno. Kin glared at the girl's comment, but did nothing. Neji-san I suggest you go to the infirmary and get some rest. You look like you're about to fall over. Naruto advised. Thank you Uzumaki-san. I think I will do that. Neji bowed to them and left the room, a bit unsteadily. Whether from physical or mental exhaustion was anyone's guess. Other people in the box were lost in their own thoughts during the exchange though, and most could have cared less about the pink-haired girl. Man, Naruto really is strong. That jutsu alone was impressive. To turn someone's attacks against them. It's a double-edged sword, but I can see where it would be a problem in the situations he said. Still, I wonder just how strong he is. I know I'm definitely not going to fight him. Shikamaru had already calculated his chances against Naruto, and they weren't good from what he saw. So that's where Kin's been hiding. She got herself a little leaf boy toy, and she's sharing. Never thought I'd see that. Well at least she has some decent taste. He was pretty strong. However he's not strong enough to beat Odo. Soon you will know just how wrong your path was Suchi Kin. Dosu glared at the trio with murder on his mind, only outmatched by the redhead nearby, but his thoughts were only on spilling as much blood as possible. He still hasn't shown off much. He's smart. If he wasn't so young I'd swear he was a jonin at least. 
Well they did have that young Uchiha that was quickly promoted. Did they already know our plans before the exam already started? Hell, I don't care anymore. That was just pure strength in someone younger than me. It's too bad Gara looks like he's ready. I would have liked to get closer to him. Tamari looked away from the scene a bit saddened that she couldn't be part of it. With a cage for a father and a psychopath for a brother most boys were afraid of even getting near her. Those that did want to get close were only looking for power, like Baki. The only one who didn't seem to be caring about how strong Naruto was, was Konkuro. He was too busy thinking with a different head. Man two girls at one. If we weren't about to kill each other I'd be asking him for tips. Their thoughts we broken as the proctor announced the next match. Haruno Sakura vs. Suchi Kin. Ha this should be easy. Let's go slut. I don't want to be out there too long. I need to be here when Sasuke-kun arrives. Don't worry Pinky. When I'm through with you I'm sure he'll be more than happy to visit you, in the hospital. Both girls glared at each other before heading down to the stadium floor. Kin stole one last look at Naruto and received a nod in return. Her grin instantly went ear to ear. Oh I am so going to enjoy this. Chapter 18. The Finals Invasion. Kin and Sakura faced each other right where Neji and Naruto had previously stood. Genma looked between the two and could see the hatred in their eyes. I'm going to have to keep a close eye on these two. Otherwise this is going to end in a bloodbath. Checking the fighters he stepped back as before. Begin. After the last match the tension in the stadium was obvious. The crowd wanted to see more of what these little ninja were capable of. What is it that you see in that Uchiha asshole anyway Pinky? From what I've heard he is the most arrogant prick on the planet, and from what I've seen he's no match for Naruto-sama in any aspect of being a ninja. The only thing he does overshadow Naruto-sama in is his ego. Kin stood there without a care in the world. Not even trying to defend herself against the other girls since she knew it would be far too easy to beat her based on what she showed in the preliminaries. Shut up you bitch. How dare you talk about Sasuke-kun like that. He could kick Naruto Baka's ass around Konoha blindfolded. Sakura huffed as she ran towards the Oto Nin. Grabbing a few kanai she whipped them at her opponent who easily dodged or parried with her own Sanban. Pathetic. Kin stated in a disgusted tone. Sakura ignored the statement as she created two bunshin hoping to confuse the other girl. Like I wouldn't know how to beat a bunshin. Especially when they are made so poorly. She whipped out a some more sanban and threw three towards separate opponents. Two passed right through, but the third was dodged. She didn't stop there though and charged towards the one that dodged. As she got close she brought out a kanai and with a few quick slashes, that Sakura could only half block, she jumped back to admire her handiwork. Sakura looked at herself wondering just where the girl had cut here. She couldn't see any blood and began to grin thinking that maybe her opponent missed. Her hopes were dashed aside though as the fabric of her dress started to separate. To her horror, chunks of cloth started to peel away and float to the ground until she was standing there in nothing but panties. She covered her chest and sank to her knees screaming as she clenched her eyes closed. Kya, she had never in her life wanted to disappear as much as she wanted to now. So pathetic. Naruto-kun told me how such a thing wouldn't bother you since you had been this exposed before when you tried to get back to your dear Sasuke Tem. I do see though that at least Ino-chan was right when she told me you didn't need a bra. You really are like a boy in that respect. Shish shut up. Sakura screamed with tears in her eyes. Crying at your age. What would your dear Sasuke-kun think of you now? Probably the same thing most of the people here are thinking. What a worthless little cunt she is. You're an embarrassment to the term Kunoichi. At least Ino-chan seems to have gotten over that egotistical piece of shit that you're so infatuated with. Over in the stands Ino flinched a little. She knew she was bad, but at least she was now considered better than Sakura. That was a start. Likewise, Inoichi was smiling up in the stands. He had noticed the difference in his daughter, and while it was a bit late for it to be of any help in this exam, he already saw a change in her that she wanted to become stronger rather than follow a boy around blindly. I'll kill you. Sakura leapt to her feet and charged at Kin with one hand wrapped around a kanai, and the other keeping her chest from view. You really intend to fight me with only one hand? Kin jerked her fingers and immediately two bells rang. 
Sakura was sent to her knees as she grabbed her head in pain. She looked at Kin with loathing. WH what did you do you bitch? These are special bells. The sound they make disorients those who hear it, and the more they hear it the worse it gets. She rang the bells again and saw Sakura wince. Sakura listened to Kin's short explanation and when the bells rang again her vision distorted. She now saw five Kin standing there smirking at her. Now how about we finish your punishment? Kin walked slowly over to the confused and frightened girl as she took out another two kanai. With a flick of her wrist the blades were gone and embedded in the ground at Sakura's sides. There now, that's better. Sakura once again checked herself, but once again found no scratches. She wasn't called a brain for nothing though as she soon realized exactly what happened. Her eyes widened at the realization. N-N no. Tears renewed themselves in her eyes as the crowd struggled to understand what happened. Get up bitch. Kin didn't give her a choice as she roughly hoisted Sakura to her feet by her throat. The pinket grabbed the front and back of her panties just as the sides started to peel away. Now that won't do. We're ninja, we have to up the stakes every fight. Since you ran out in your panties in the forest, that means we have to show more now. A sadistic grin passed Kin's face as she punched Sakura in the gut. The girl doubled over in pain and reflexively grabbed her abdomen. This of course released her hold on her panties and they settled onto the ground, completely exposing her to the view of everyone in the arena. Now get up. Kin once again hoisted Sakura up. This time by the hair as the girl's hands once again reflexively moved to the source of highest pain. Sakura grabbed at Kin's wrists and flailed around completely forgetting her state of dress, or lack thereof. Her body was completely exposed as Kin slowly turned her around for everyone to see. Up in the stands people were starting to wonder if this was even a serious bout, or if it was comedic relief staged by Konoha. Those in the stadium who knew the two though knew that this was a real fight, and that it was simply pathetic. L let me go. Place please let me go. Sakura cried as all hope of leaving with decency was shattered. Kin obliged and let go of the girl's hair, but before she could cover herself she had another fist embedded in her stomach, followed by a foot to the jaw making her fall backwards. Crying and dazed, Sakura held the side of her jaw as she tried to push aside the pain and embarrassment in order to put up some sort of defense. She could barely see shapes through her tear-blurred eyes and the pain of her mouth made it hurt to even try to talk. Some part of her mind wondered if her opponent had broken her jaw and she could already feel it swelling in her palm. She looked towards the proctor hoping he would call the match since forfeiting seemed out of her abilities at the moment. Unknown to the fangirl. The Odo Nin was behind her now. Kin brought her mouth close to the girl's ear. You've been a pain in the ass for Naruto-kun for a long time. Perhaps it's time to return the favor. Kin poked a Sanban into Sakura's posterior to let her know just what she meant. On second thought, I have a better idea. She moved the weapon forward slightly. How about I take the one thing that all girls want to give to their one and only? I'm sure Sasuke Tem won't mind at all. Sakura's eyes went wide as she felt the point of a weapon switch from one of her openings to another. And no. Genma's eyes widened as he saw what Kin was planning, but he was too late in moving into action. With a jerk of her hand, Kin shoved the blunt end of the weapon up towards the other girl's hole, but was stopped as Sakura's legs clamped together tight enough to completely stall the intruder's movements. The assailant was rather surprised and impressed until she saw a liquid running down her victim's legs. Oh now that's just disgusting. You really are the worst ninja ever. Soiling yourself over such a thing. Disgusted with the bubblegum princess now and not really wanting to risk getting the foul liquid on herself, she jumped back, watching as Sakura staggered a couple steps back herself from the loss of balance. Willing to add one last insult, Kin took out two more Sanban and shot them into the backs of Sakura's knees. As Kin let go of her, Sakura fought to keep her balance. She wanted nothing more than to disappear right now. Not only was she humiliated, beaten and nearly defiled but she would now have to face her Sasuke-kun completely defeated. Thinking things couldn't possibly get worse, or afraid they very well might, she started to raise her hand to admit defeat but was forced to scream out instead when she felt pain in the backs of her legs. Before her mind was able to process what was going on she started to fall forward. As she hit the ground she found it was surprisingly, dot wet. 
The source of the liquid was realized as soon as she took a breath. Sakura had landed into the puddle that she had made herself. Somebody, just kill me and get it over with. As if accepting her fate, the girl made no move to pull herself out of the muck as she instead curled into a ball and started to sob uncontrollably. Winner Suchi Kin. He rushed over just in case the girl planned to continue anyway, but to his relief Kin just huffed at the completely defeated Sakura on the ground, leaving her to weep as she strode off towards the competitor's booth. Genma quickly signaled for the medics to come get the girl. She may not have been hurt, but he'd do what he could to help cover the girl on her way out of the stadium. They complied and put her on a stretcher after covering her with a blanket, then rushed off the floor to make room for the next fight. Ha ha. That was awesome Kin Chan. Haku was the first to greet the Odo Nin but was soon joined by Naruto who gave Kin a congratulatory kiss. Good job Kin. You really went too easy on her though. Yeah but if I beat her too much we wouldn't be able to see her face when the Tem comes, right? Speaking of which, shouldn't he be here by now? His match is next. As if to answer Kin's question, Genma's voice rang out over the stadium. Due to one of the next fight's participants not being available at this time we will be moving on to the fourth match. Figures. Tem gets special privileges. Proctor I forfeit. Konkuro shouted out over the railing. He looked over at Shino, but the boy was just leaning up against the wall as though nothing happened. Honestly he couldn't tell if the bug user was awake or asleep. Fine. Tamari vs Nara Shikamaru. Tamari huffed at her brother and waved her fan before hopping on it and riding the current to the stadium floor. Are you coming down, or are you going to forfeit too? She called up to Shikamaru. So troublesome. Fighting another girl and I don't even want to be here. After those two matches ours isn't going to be that exciting, and with the match coming up it'll be easily overshadowed. I shouldn't have even come today. Shikamaru considered his options for withdrawal but it was soon taken out of his hands with a quick shove from behind. As he crashed to the ground he could hear the voice of his assaulter. Go get her Shika. Show him what Konoha can do. Naruto shouted as he gave his fellow Genin a thumbs up while Kin and Haku smirked from his sides. With their hands out, showing who else had pushed him. Troublesome blondes and their troublesome girlfriends. Shikamaru said to himself as he looked from the balcony to his opponent only turning his head to change view so he didn't waste energy. Are you going to get up and fight, or are you going to wait there and get crushed? Tamari said as the boy got pelted with trash from the crowd. After a minute of no response she got tired. Fine. She hoisted her fan and charged him. Well I would rather just lay here and watch the clouds, but a man really shouldn't lose to a woman. He dug in his pouch and finished just as Temeri's fan came down and made the ground where he'd been laying explode in a cloud of dirt. Once it cleared enough to see, Shikamaru was standing on his kanai which was embedded into the stadium wall. I guess I don't really have a choice. I'll fight. Tamari blasted out another burst of wind from her fan, but just like her previous attack he disappeared from where he was. Suddenly she was forced to retreat as his shadow came from her side and attempted to connect to her. An inevitable game of cat and mouse ensued as Tamari blasted apart the trees that surrounded the area while Shikamaru hid amongst them. Meanwhile Shikamaru used any opening to send his shadow out, showing how it constantly got longer with each passing minute as the shadows of the environment grew longer. Tamari could see the problems she would have if she continued to drag the fight out. Are you going to keep hiding in the trees coward of Konoha? She had to immediately dodge the incoming shadow and once again marked its peak before making a barrier out of her fan as she stuck it into the ground. Okay this is getting old fast. If I make a bunch and I might be able to trick him long enough to make an opening. Then I'll take him out in one swing. She quickly began the needed hand signs but had to stop midway as her body suddenly refused to move. Realization dawned on her as she looked at her own hands in horror, not wanting to believe what was going on. There should have been no way for him to get this much distance. Dot how? Shikamaru stood up and stretched, causing Tamari to make the same movements much to the crowd's amusement. Some of them couldn't help but wonder if they would get the same show as the previous fight. Kajmain no jutsu success. Glad you didn't see through that one, I was running out of chakra. I'll admit you did well to figure out so many of my plans, but it seems you didn't take into account the field of battle. What are you talking about? 
There should be no way your shadow could go that far. Were you deceiving me the whole time into thinking your shadow couldn't go as far as it can? Not exactly. Explaining things is such a bother. Oh well. You see with you cutting all the trees up you weren't thinking about what else you were doing. See all the leaves and branches on the ground. He watched as Tamari took a quick glance and saw exactly what he meant. I see you figured it out. You see my shadow can pass freely through other shadows, so it doesn't waste as much length there. With the shadows of all these branches and leaves littering the ground, it was easy to just weave through them to make my shadow go just a little farther each time. You were beaten by your own wind. I'm not beaten yet. You can't make me give up. I can't. Shikamaru said, cocking an eyebrow. He slowly put his hand up causing Tamari to panic a bit and the crowd to be on the edge of their seats. More from the long match finally being over than anything. I give up. Quote dot 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 quote. Quote dot 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 quote. What? Geez. Like you said I can't make you give up, and I don't have a whole lot of chakra left. I've run through numerous plans in my head, but they are either too exhausting or use too much chakra, so there's no point in delaying anymore. I give up. Shikamaru released his jutsu, freeing Tamari before stretching again. Quote dot dot dot. Winner Tamari. He's not the most aggressive fighter here, but he's definitely got the planning down. He thought quite a bit ahead and even though he didn't win it was still impressive. Yeah, if we look at Chunin qualities he's definitely got a good head on his shoulders. Coming back saying you got the mission done but your team was slaughtered isn't as good as coming back after failing, but bringing everyone back alive, well at least for non-vital missions. I think we've got ourselves another good candidate, though he is a little lazy and that's going to hurt him. That kin girl doesn't seem quite ready though. Sure she played with the Haruno's mind and basically embarrassed her into submission, but those are more specialized qualities. Her opponent was weak though, so we can't say if those were her full capabilities. We'll just have to wait and see in the next round. As the two combatants left the field Genma called the next set. Dosu vs Amagawa Haku. Good luck Haku-chan. Naruto kissed her quickly before she left. Kin-chan. This one's for you okay. To the surprise of those paying attention, Kin extracted herself from Naruto's arms and gave Haku a kiss as well. Naruto wasn't the only one left open-mouthed as the girl left the room. Not just two, but they are into each other too. Now I kind of hope we fail so I really can get some tips. Konkuro was able to think as he slumped against the wall with a crimson waterfall shooting from his nostrils. Dosu just tsked before walking out the door as well leaving a silent room until the last two competitors came back in. Hey Shika. Not too bad. You know you missed a few ways to beat her, but your strategy wasn't bad at all. Gee thanks Naruto. Maybe next time you can give me some pointers beforehand. The Nara replied sarcastically. Naruto just laughed. Good job to you too Tamari. You did well considering you were up against one of Konoha's best strategists. You really put him on his heels. Tamari looked at him once before looking back at the ground as she passed. I still lost, to a Konoha ninja. Her brother didn't seem to miss the meaning of her words as he grimaced at the thought of a Konoha nin being able to beat his sister like that, and that same ninja trading barbs with another that seemed powerful as well. Hey, don't get so down. We all have to lose sometime. Like we've seen you do so often huh? She shot back. I had enough ass kicking done to me to last a lifetime. Don't even think you know my life. His voice was cold and sent chills through them. Only one of them really knew what he meant though. It startled Tamari and Konkuro a little when their youngest brother turned around and seemed to be sizing up the blonde. They were even more amazed when the boy didn't flinch. You will prove my existence, Uzumaki Naruto. So you are friends with Kin now. More than friends it seems. Don't worry though. If you both live through what's coming I'll make you both my slaves. Unfortunately the blonde won't be so lucky. So you're Kin Chan's teammate Dosu huh? Not much to look at. I think I'll stick with those two for now. I heard about how you treat your girls and I'm not really into the whole ropes and whips thing. Neither was Kin, so unfortunately for you I'm going to have to pay you back for all the pain you've caused her. Haku readied a couple Sanban and got ready for a fight. Genma looked between the two before backing away. Begin. Dosu wasted no time getting in close. 
with a clang of Haku Sanban against Dosu's melody arm. He used his chakra on the sound wave and twisted it towards Haku's ear. Expecting the resulting scream of pain he jumped back, but no sound came from the girl. In fact she didn't look phased at all. You can negate my jutsu. He asked curiously. Haku smirked. Something like that. She darted in again, tossing more Sanban as she went. If you have no better tricks then you might as well give up. Hyoten. Sabama Fubuki. Out of the small amount of water left over from Karata came a swarm of ice swallows that darted for Dosu. While he did his best to evade them he still took a few hits. Meanwhile Haku took out a couple of her own bottles of water and began to calmly pour them on the ground. Not even caring when Dosu made a break for her. As he got close she suddenly jumped away while forming more hand size. Consider this your punishment. Hyoden. Hayachu. Dosu. Having completely ignored the water on the ground was far too late to even have an idea of what was coming. Genma as well had no clue what was about to happen. The only one who did, turned his back on the spectacle that was about to take place. Just as Dosu put a foot down near the patch of water numerous spikes of ice grew out of it at an alarming rate. It seemed the Hyoden users decided to give their jutsu names that belied their potency. Mere fractions of a second after they had formed, Dosu was already hanging limp but twitching, suspended two meters in the air for all to see on crystallized cones of water. As one last punishment, and before Genma could call the match, Haku turned her back and muttered one last word. Sakuan. She could hear the cries of horror from the crowd as behind her the ice spikes exploded inside the still impaled Dosu. Genma gulped a little from the display. Quote dot dot dot. Winner. Amagawa Haku. He hastily waved a clean up crew in. While it wasn't uncommon for someone to die in these fights, it usually wasn't done so, dramatically. The worst they normally saw was someone burnt to death. Now though they had to pick up separate pieces of Dosu's body from around the arena as the sharpened ice shards had sliced through it just as well as any regular blade would have. Well that one was brutal. Katetsu said as his eyes roamed over the scene of the men cleaning up the pieces of what was once an Odogaker ninja. Quote dot dot dot. Yeah, I think we're going to have to name her the Ice Queen instead of Kurenai. Up in the cage box the case cage was gripping his seat a little tighter. So many good candidates this year Hokage Dono. You seem to have another group of fine ninja at your disposal. I envy you greatly. In his mind though he had very different thoughts. A Hyoten user. I thought they were dead. Dot and that blonde kid at the beginning. I have to try and get them later. For now though Sasuke-kun will have to do. Oh ho ho. Yes, they are doing very well. Well most of them. I admit I'm not certain how that Haruno made it this far. That Odo Nin made short work of her, but I would bet that even a proper academy student could have done the same. I thank you for the compliment though Case Cage Dono. The twitch in the Case Cage's hand was not missed by the older ninja. The real problem now is the Uchiha. He still hasn't shown I'm told so we will have to disqualify him and move on. He turned to give the order to his attendant but was stopped when the case cage spoke up. I think that would be unwise Hokage Dono. Serutobi stopped and looked back at the other cage. Many people have come just to see this fight, myself included. It would be a shame to take away that purpose don't you think? Perhaps a short delay is in order. The Hokage arched an eyebrow, curious of the motives of his fellow cage, but passed the word on. Thank you Hokage Dono. I am agreeing to this only to allow such an anticipated fight, but he will still be ineligible for promotion to Chunin. My ninja are expected to be on time when it is required of them. Such disrespect for protocol will not go unpunished. Here is an announced with a scowl. As Genma was about to announce the final fight of the first round a ninja once again landed next to him. Understood. He told the ninja before addressing the crowd once again. Due to the expectations of the next fight and the preparations required for it, we are going to have a 10 minute break in order for you all to take care of any business you may need to in order to not miss the match. We understand how important this one is to many of you. Many groans were heard from the stands, but others were relieved for the break. Many didn't want to risk leaving the scene of the cleanup and end up missing the Uchiha's fight. Figures, more special treatment for the Uchiha. Naruto scoffed. He must be really good for them to wait this long for him. 
Konkuro wondered aloud. Ha. Even you could beat him Kabuki boy. Haku laughed. It's war paint. The puppeteer yelled. Then turned sharply. Angry at the insult. Ignore him. He gets that a lot. His sister informed them. Nods of understanding bounced around the room. A knock on the door interrupted them. Suchi Kin. Your Jonin sensei is here to see you. Kin stiffened. Tell him that I don't want to see him right now. A brief pause. He says that it's for something you forgot to pick up for your matches. I suggest you take any advantage you can get in this one girly. That Uchiha is going to be tough to get by. Don't worry she'll be right out. Naruto called over much to Kin and Haku's horror. He just winked at them before putting up a henge and heading for the door. Getting the idea, Haku moved in front of Kin to keep her hidden from view. After Naruto left Kin shoved the older girl out of the way. Are you crazy? We just let him go with a Jonin. My Jonin sensei. I know this is Naruto-kun, but what if he's found out? She was on the verge of tears knowing what could be in store for the boy so Haku hugged her close. Shish don't worry. He knows what he's doing. Besides, it wouldn't be the first time he's faced a Jonin and Wan. People in the room looked at her shocked. Most didn't know what she was talking about, but from the glare she gave them they knew she wasn't going to be spilling anything else either. On the other side of the room Tamari had a firm hold on Konkuro, who turned to her. What are you stopping me for? That kid could be getting information about the invasion. He whispered to her sharply. If my hunch is right, they already know. I would rather not break our cover with a confrontation here. Gara would walk away fine, but I plan on staying in one's piece for a while longer if you don't mind. She shot back. He glared at her once, but didn't say anything else. So sensei, what did you need to give me? Naruto asked the man he met in Kin's voice. You should feel honored Kin-chan. You get to be a main part of Odokage-sama's plans for this place. The nin lead Naruto to a room in the subbasement of the structure and opened the door to reveal three coffins labeled 1, 2 and 4. The lid to the middle one was still open and he could see the seals on the inside. The Jonin pushed her into the room roughly and he staggered forward. Two more men came out of the shadows and grabbed her before shoving her inside the box and closing the lid. Inside the seals took on an eerie glow as he went over them. It wasn't long before he felt his chakra being absorbed and his strength waver. Before he fell asleep though there was one more thing to do. Outside the box the Jonin went into a trance, channeling their own chakra to the three coffins and activating their seals. They stopped suddenly when they heard the door open behind them. The one that brought Kin down turned to see their door guard looking inside. Idiot. Stay out there and guard the door. If someone were to discover us Otokage-sama's plans would be ruined. Instead of listening the man stumbled into the room before falling flat on his face as a gout of blood spurted from his back. Shit. They found us. Guard the coffins. All three ninja shot up and watched the entrance. They watched it so intently that almost all of them missed the commotion behind them. With cries of pain the two Odo Nin on each side fell forward. The one to the Jonin's left was already dead but the one to his right was writhing around, trying to grab his back to stop the pain of the long slash down his back. He spun on his heel just in time to block the black-bladed sword of his opponent. You. Dot you followed us down here. You must be more foolish than I thought. I commend you though for taking out my teammates, even if they were pretty worthless. Too bad you're a bit late though. Your little girlfriend is already halfway to worm food. Well you made a few mistakes there. First, that wasn't kin you lead here that was my cage bunchin in a hench. Thanks to that, I know what is going on inside the coffins right now too. Your seal has a flaw in it, did you know that? It's a small one, but easily exploitable. I plan to do just that when those other two activate. No, I won't try to destroy them. I'm no moron. The Jonin looked shocked at first, then scowled. You've already ruined enough of Odokage sama's plan. You will have to be disposed of. I'll try not to kill you though. With any luck I can stuff you in that coffin and still have what we need. The man grinned as he pushed on his kanai a little harder. Oh I plan on getting in that coffin now that I know what it's for but not with your help. I'll admit you're stronger than I am now though. Then give up and rest peacefully. It'll be like going to sleep. 
The Jonin smiled at Naruto sadistically. Not quite. You see I still have a trick up my sleeve. Naruto literally pulled his sleeve back with his free hand and touched the seal on it. Instantly the lines he touched turned from black to gray. He did the same on his chest and instantly the Jonin knew what had happened as his grip began to falter. Jay just what kind of monster are you? The man exclaimed just as Naruto's sword overcame him and slashed him deeply in the shoulder. The kind that haunts your worst nightmares. He said coldly as he began to stalk towards his prey. S stay away. The Jonin searched for another kanai. Finding none he began a series of hand signs. Kaden. Enden. He cried and spat a ball of fire at Naruto. For the crime of trying to hurt one of my precious people. Dot dot. I sentence you to death. It could have been a suicide move, or just instinct, but Naruto ran right at the flame and swung his sword through it. To both his and the Odo Nin's surprise the fire did nothing they expected. It didn't blow out, split and fly off, it didn't continue going on to incinerate its target either. Instead it rebounded and shot right back at its user. The Jonin screamed out as the ball hit him as he was too stunned and it was too fast for him to move out of the way. As the screams died along with the man, Naruto used a simple water jutsu to put him out so the smoke wouldn't alert anyone of what happened. He created some bunshin to pick through and find anything useful as he went back to the now empty coffin. He opened the lid with and looked over the seals inside, considering them a moment. Taking out one of his scrolls he unsealed his own sealing supplies and got to work. The first thing to go was the seal that drained chakra, and by the time he was done the only part remaining was the one that anchored the summon to its creator. Hey. Hubby Tem's in for a surprise. He looked at the other two coffins and a grin split his lips. Well I can't do anything for the poor bastards inside, but that doesn't mean I can't get a little revenge for them. Once again he took out his brush and got to work. As Naruto re-entered the competitor's box he was immediately glomped by a crying kin. Thank Kami. I was so afraid. I though he would kill you. What happened? Oh we talked and he gave you some tips for the next round. Nothing much. Well, we did learn something about my sword. He smiled at her but found her narrowing her eyes at him. I'll tell you later. You better. What happened to my sensei? She asked a little unsure if she wanted to know that he was still stalking around. Oh he decided to go to take a smoke break, so he won't be joining you again. He wishes you the best though, in your new life. He watched Kin's confusion turn to realization just before she hugged him even tighter and kissed him hard. Once he was able to peel away from her he looked at Haku. I've been gone for a bit, did Tem show. He just shunned Shin in with Kakashi down in the arena a few seconds before you came back. They had to extend the wait another five minutes for him, and he even had the nerve to ask if he was late when he showed up. I hope that soon a guy turns him into paste. She glared over the railing at the source of her annoyance. It's been bothering me for a while now. You're from the same village and yet some of you seem to hate each other like opposite sides in a war. Why is that? Tamari asked, walking cautiously over to the three. He's a self-righteous, egotistical asshole that thinks he's better than everyone just because of his name. He's also power-hungry and ever since his brother slaughtered his whole clan and went missing, making him the last Uchiha in Konoha he's considered anything he wanted to be his without question. He even tried to break into my property numerous times to steal from me as well as fight me for my possessions, have the council try to make me give them to him and even try to take my girlfriends by similar methods. Hell he was going to try to rape them in the forest until I beat him into unconsciousness to stop him. It doesn't help that most of Konoha pampers him, at least the civilians do. Naruto's rant ended with a huff as he joined Haku at the railing to look at the two competitors in the stadium. Tamari just turned back to her brother with a surprised, oh on her face. Apparently it was a rather touchy subject. Uchiha Sasuke. Sabaku no Gara, are you ready? One moment Proctor. Sasuke said and turned to one blonde in particular that was glaring at him. Hey Dobi. Don't look so mad. After I wipe the floor with this one you're next. He smirked, but grimaced suddenly and jerked forward as something hit the back of his head. He turned around and saw that Gara hadn't moved. Looking toward the ground he saw the large wooden cork from Gara's gourd laying at his feet. His head jerked around to the booth again as he heard and saw most of its contents snickering at him. 
Even Shino's shoulders looked to be shaking a bit. Infuriated he turned back to Gara. You'll pay for that. Then stop wasting my time. You have blood to spill and mother is thirsty. Genma looked between the two once more. Begin. He was forced to jump back further than normal this time as Sasuke jumped the gun and went immediately for his signature move. Kaden. Gokaku no Jutsu. The fireball was fruitless however, no matter how big it was. Gara's sand completely blocked the flame with seemingly no effort from the boy. Undeterred, Sasuke followed up by switching to Taijutsu. With a few shuriken leading the way he rushed in and began pounding away at the sand. This is futile Uchiha. You are not one to prove my existence as I once thought. You are weak. Even that strange green clad boy was worth more than this. His words only served to make Sasuke smirk. You want a stronger opponent. As you wish. Suddenly Sasuke blurred from view. Gara was startled a little, but the sand rose to keep up and formed a ring a couple feet off the ground. His opponent began circling the ring looking for an opening. Is this all you have, Uchiha? Come. Mother is impatient. You asked for it. Sasuke suddenly changed directions, sliding under the ring of sand he was able to land a kick to Gara's jaw, sending the boy flying away only to be caught by his sand. He left his foot high in the air to illustrate exactly what happened as he grinned at his opponent before slowly bringing his leg back down. He readied himself for another assault, but before he could rush in Gara made a hand sign and the sand around him began to shift around. Wasting no time, he threw a barrage of shuriken only for them to be caught by a sand replica of his target. The Uchiha rushed in and attacked the Sunabunshin, pummeling the clone into particles with a few hits. Not that Gara really cared. Because of the Uchiha's insistence to fight close range against him, he put himself well within range of the sand. With a movement of his hand, Gara manipulated the sand near the boy's legs and had him suspended in the air in moments. He slowly walked up to Sasuke and stared him in the eyes. You are pathetic Uchiha. I may have to question my existence just by beating you. The strong were not meant to prove themselves to ants. His captive growled and swung out at him, but it was futile as more tendrils of sand came up and wrapped around his wrists before stretching him out, upside down. Gara then did the unthinkable in the minds of his siblings. Instead of attacking his victim with his sand he took it into his own hands, literally. Sasuke felt every kick and punch that hit him. It was surprisingly softer than he'd feared it would be, but his body had no defense against the onslaught. He struggled against his bonds but was unable to move until Gara simply dropped him. What the hell was that all about? No one told me he used taijutsu. I wasn't ready for that. He tried to keep from holding his stomach in pain as he stood. Not willing to betray any pain even as a small trickle of blood left his split lip. It seems that will not provide enough blood to appease mother. I will have to find another way to drain it. Gara spoke almost to himself. Sorry pal, but you're not draining me of any more blood. Gara looked up at the raven-haired boy as if just noticing he was standing again. No, mother doesn't care about your blood, but you will be of use to find the best way to drain Uzumaki's. Sasuke gritted his teeth and growled at the insult to his pride. This mere genin was trying to say that he was only worthy of being some kind of experiment for a better opponent. What was worse was that the kid seemed to think Naruto would be a more satisfying fight than any the Uchiha could give him. Seething, Sasuke went over his options as he watched Gara consider his own. Just as he was about to charge in again the Suna Nin made a sign and the sand around them began to swirl inward towards its controller. Mother says to end this quickly. She wants to taste the Uzumaki faster. Goodbye Uchiha Sasuke. Suna no Tama. There was no hate. No arrogance, just a blank statement as though he already knew the outcome. Knowing nothing about the jutsu Sasuke rushed in and tried to bunch through the barrier ending up rewarded with only a set of bruised knuckles as spikes surrounded him. The only thing saving him from being impaled was the fact that he activated his Sharingan as he rushed in. So now I can't see you. Sasuke jumped back and the spikes receded. He could hear Gara talking inside the shell but couldn't make out what was being said. Shrugging it off he took no notice of the smaller sphere of sand that appeared nearby as he rushed back in, intent on testing the durability of the shield. Every kick and punch was met by reaction from the sand as spikes shot out wherever he tried to attack. Dot but you can see me. 
Then I guess I'll have to try something new. I had hoped to save this for a different fight, but it seems to be my only option. He quickly ran across the arena and up the wall. Stopping he made some hand signs getting some gasps of disbelief from the audience and ninja alike. Kakashi. You taught him Chidori. What were you thinking? Guy scolded his rival. First, you aren't one that should be talking, teaching Lee the gates and lotus. Second, I didn't teach it to him, he stole it with the Sharingan. I just taught him how to not kill himself from using it. Apparently that wasn't enough of an explanation for Guy, who snorted and turned back to the fight. Sighing Kakashi did the same. Naruto smacked his forehead. Kakashi you moron. Teaching him something like that. Naruto-sama what is it? Kin asked while Haku indicated as being a little curious as well. The ice user had seen the attack before at the bridge in Nami, but didn't know the details. It's his Chidori. A lightning-based attack. The perfect thing against Gara's sand, but at the same time far too dangerous for a genin to be using. He explained. You're one to talk Mr. Cage Bunshin. Shikamaru chided. That may be Shikamaru's sand, but this technique is an assassination jutsu meant for one thing only. Naruto-san's clones have many abilities, and he has proven to use them to their fullest extent in all aspects of his life. Shino decided to break his silent streak for once as he looked toward the crackling ball. You seem to be interested in it Shino-san. Kin said, wondering why the bug user was so intent on watching the jutsu. I am merely trying to keep my hive under control. They are a bit active because of the raw chakra, but if I were to let them near it they would assuredly be electrocuted. They had to stifle some chuckles at the, moth to flame, reaction of Shino's bugs. Sasuke charged down the wall, Chidori in hand as he ran at top speed toward the ball of sand on the ground. Dodging the sand spikes as fast as he could he was able to, through some amount of luck, pass by them and shove the attack into the sphere. The stadium went quiet for a few seconds as everyone waited to see the result. Then Sasuke suddenly screamed in pain and tried to pull his hand free. Finding himself unable to move he reactivated his Sharingan and formed another Chidori inside the ball and pulled himself free. A tan arm with purple stripes followed him as he retreated until it stopped and began to drag itself back to the sphere. Curses could be heard from Tamari and Konkuro as they figured out what was happening. An inhuman screech went through the stadium and for a moment the Konoha portion of the audience looked around for any sign of pink hair before realizing it came from the stadium floor where Sasuke stood shocked at something he saw through the hole he made in the shell. Then it was calm again as numerous feathers started to drift down through the stadium while the sand crumbled away revealing Gara who was holding a bleeding area in his shoulder. In seconds Tamari and Konkuro were at his sides. Sasuke started forward but Baki appeared and blocked his path as Genma did likewise on the Konohanin's side. Baki looked at Gara quick before looking at his siblings. Get him out of here. Let him recover, then come back and continue with the plan. Hoisting their brother on their shoulders the Genin team quickly left nearly unimpeded as the rest of the shinobi were now too involved in their own battles to pay attention to three harmless kids. So this is what Odo and Suna were up to all this time. Genma looked around at the organized chaos unfolding before looking over his shoulder at Sasuke. You are no match for those three Uchiha-san. Go to the shelters and wait out this fight. We don't need someone inexperienced getting killed from being foolish. He swore as the boy seemed to ignore him as he smirked and headed off after the trio. In Sasuke's mind Genma had said, you are already Chunin level Uchiha-san. Now go and defend Konoha like a true shinobi. Don't let them get away. Though he could care less about the second portion he was more than willing to accept the third. That's a very obedient ninja you have there. Too bad he just went to his death. Now how about we join the fun? Baki charged in, forcing Genma to block his kanai rather than stop the seemingly rogue Genin. As Naruto watched the feathers fall he immediately dispelled them. Shouts of Kai rang out in the small room as the rest of those inside realized what was happening as well and followed his lead. It was a good thing they acted so quickly too as two Odo Nin crashed through the door along with two Suna Nin. Kill them all. Both sides shouted as the small room was quickly filled with the sounds of battle. No one wanted to risk a jutsu for fear of taking out their comrades though, save those who had the control to hit only their target. 
Naruto quickly separated two of the enemy from the others with a stream of fire down the center of the enemy line. The two he didn't face were further separated as Haku and Kin faced one and Shikamaru and Shino faced the other. Kin and Haku had a pretty easy time even though their opponent was a Chunin. With Kin disorienting him with her bells Haku was able to trap him in ice. Once he was immobile Kin walked up and calmly put a kunai in his temple. They turned to see the other ninja being incapacitated by Shino's bugs as Shikamaru held him fast with his shadow. Seeing as they now had no one left to go after they all turned towards Naruto to see him cleaning off his blade on the shirt of one of the two beheaded ninja at his feet. He looked up at them and shrugged. What? Kin and Haku just rolled their eyes while Shikamaru and Shino looked a bit pale. Naruto turned serious though. Haku, help those two as much as you can. You have 20 seconds. She nodded and took the two to the side. Kin go check on the daimyos. If they are safe then check on our friends in the council box. She was about to leave but Naruto grabbed her arm. She thought he was going to kiss her but instead he reached up and ripped her Odo headband off. Stay safe. Go. She nodded to him and vanished over the side of the box. After she was gone Haku was back at his side as he looked up towards the cage's box. Sarutobi took note of the feathers falling as he turned his head towards the case cage. The other man took the same action and as their eyes met a smoke bomb exploded on the balcony hiding them from view. The Hokage's attendant yelled for him to run but it was too late as a kanai buried itself in his chest. The case cage leapt to the roof with the Hokage under his arm and a kanai to the old man's throat. A team of Anbu darted after them but had to turn as the case cage's attendants appeared behind them. With a quick slice the two men became four but the pieces of the bodies didn't stop and they tossed off their cloaks revealing four teens. The four now exposed Odo Nin quickly flashed through seals before pushing their palms out and naming their collaboration Jutsu. Shishienjin. A purple wall formed around them and the two cage. One foolish Anbu tested fate and tried to jump through only to be repelled and have his clothes catch fire. It's a shield. Don't touch it or it will burn you alive. The Anbu captain called out for all those in hearing range. What about Hokage-sama? We'll have to have faith that he can still hold his own. Inside the case cage looked out over the mayhem. It's beautiful isn't it? Serutobi-sensei. War is a terrible thing, but I have no doubt that you are enjoying this. Orochimaru. The case cage tore his mask off and part of his face to show that he was exactly who Serutobi said making those outside shake with rage. Orochimaru. The Anbu captain whispered through gritted teeth. So the traitor came back after all. Naruto watched the purple barrier go up and immediately made some clones. He handed one of them a scroll and pushed some chakra into it to break the seal. Take this to the Anbu captain. There are instructions inside telling him what to do. If you can help it get there in one piece but your main mission is to get the scroll to them. Go. The clones rushed off toward the roof of the cage booth as fast as they could. You three are with me. We're going to see who is the closest Jonin and get our instructions from them. The four took off out of the room and scaled the wall of the stadium to the stands. Genma was technically the first one they saw, but he was busy with Baki and they were flinging too many jutsu to risk getting close, though Naruto sent a clone to him as a distraction anyway. Upon capping the stadium wall they found Kakashi and Guy fighting both Odo and Suna Ninja back to back. Distract them as best you can but don't risk getting yourselves hurt. Fight defensive while I talk to Kakashi. As they split up to do what they could to hold the enemies at bay Naruto rushed to Kakashi's side just as he stabbed a kunai into another Odo nin's head. Kakashi-san, myself and three others are ready for orders. Naruto said as he dodged a thrown kunai effortlessly and threw his own in return which struck true in Asuna Chunin's eye socket. What do you know of the situation? Sir. Hokage-sama is inside of a barrier on top of the cage booth. I'm unsure who is in with him, but I would guess at least Orochimaru and the case cage. Sasuke ran off after the Suna Genin team when they retreated after Gara was injured. Dot dot quote. He had to pause in order to block and slash an Odo ninja that was trying to take him from behind. Against Genma-san's orders, I sent Kin to check on the daimyos and the council box for the preliminary examinees. I already sent a clone with special orders along with a gift to try to deal with that shield. Orochimaru has something big planned, 
but I've thrown a kink in that plan too though I'm not certain what its entire effect will be. Again he had to stop and dodge a barrage of shuriken headed his way. Now what are your orders sir? Kakashi took a minute to digest everything he was told. Impressive. He's issued orders well, and allocated everyone according to their abilities. Hopefully his tricks will work in Hokage-sama's favor. That leaves the invasion and the Suna Genin that Sasuke is following. He took a minute to scratch his chin, idly throwing a kick into the ninja that tried to attack him. Tell me what you think should be done Naruto. The blonde looked at him a bit annoyed. Since I've done what I can to help Hokage-sama and the daimyos, short of helping them myself, I would say stopping the Uchiha. If he goes alone he's going to get himself killed and we'd never hear the end of that. Shino and Shikamaru should be plenty of help for that. Haku can go help Kin with the others. He said without hesitation. Then those are your orders. Shino, Shikamaru go with Naruto after Sasuke. This is an A-rank mission and Naruto is in charge. Kakashi summoned a small dog on the back of one of the unconscious people next to him. This is Pakun, he'll track them through the forest if they got that far. He turned to the last person. Haku, go help Kin with the others. After that assist in healing anyone you can. Hi, all five said at once. Before taking off to their respective goals. Are you sure that was wise my rival? They are just Genin. Guy, when the invasion began. Where do you think these ninja tried to strike first? They would have wanted to hit our most promising upstarts before they became an issue in later years. No doubt they sent experienced Chunin or higher to the competitor's box. If those four got out of that then they'll be fine. Guy gave a quick nod before punching his next target through the wall of the stadium. Besides, if Gara is what I suspect then Naruto may be the only one we have to match him. Outside the village walls a huge cloud of smoke rose up as an enormous snake plowed through it and directly into the village wall, creating a fissure as it passed through. It stopped just inside and looked around at all the tasty treats standing on the rooftops. Hit it with everything you've got. Don't stop until you have to. Came a cry from one of the men as the ninja surrounding the snake cut loose with all the jutsu and weapons they had. It was futile though as the snake just shrugged them off and began snatching ninja up in its massive jaws. Kuchios. Yutai Kuzushi no Jutsu. A voice echoed through the chaos as another plume of smoke rose and the snake writhed in agony under the giant toad that now sat on its back. Behold. The great Jiraiya has arrived. Jiraiya-sama. Your timing couldn't be better. Ibiki said as he landed next to the man on the amphibian's head. Ibiki. Where's Sarutobi at? Ibiki pointed solemnly towards the center of the village. He's at the stadium. It was all he needed to say as they could clearly see the purple barrier from where they were, along with exactly where it was positioned. You better be all right old man. The Anbu squad watched the exchange between the Hokage and his former student as they waited for any sign that the barrier might be weakening. They had tried everything they could think of to break through, from Jutsu to throwing Kanai at the four keeping the barrier up. All they got in return were laughs at their futile attempts. A small cough behind them made them spin and drop into their fighting stances. The danger they now faced was one they hadn't expected. With arms crossed, four Naruto clones stood looking at the Anbu captain. This is no place for a Genin Uzumaki, even one of your, talents. Flee with the others to the shelters and wait for orders. Sorry Anbu-san but boss already gave us orders. The clone replied as it tossed the scroll to the captain. He said there are instructions in there that should help with that thing in your way. Since we're just clones we'll stick around. Worst case we become distractions while you help Hokage-sama. The captain eyed the boy for a minute before turning his attention to the scroll. Opening it he indeed found instructions, along with numerous seals. He nodded and began issuing orders to his subordinates while he handed out sheets of parchment as he unsealed them from the scroll. The other Anbu took them hesitantly though and looked at them in confusion. Quote dot dot dot. Sir, are you sure it's okay to trust him? This could just be a trick. The captain looked from the man who spoke, to Naruto, then back. If you have a better idea then spill it. If not then shut up and do as you're told. A little killing intent was enough to send the man bounding over to the shield to do his part as the captain turned back to the blonde. My apologies Uzumaki-san. Sometimes they forget their place. Don't worry I'm used to it. 
Naruto replied dryly. Once all of the pieces of parchment were applied to the roof the captain placed the final seal and ordered one of his men to activate it. Nako you'll stay here and keep the seals up until we're through. After that you will go back to HQ, pick up a team and get ready for the counter-attack. Taicho, wouldn't it be better for me to be with you? I am one of the stronger members of the team. You are, but you specialize in close combat. Orochimaru excels at almost all aspects of the ninja art. We can't risk catching you in the crossfire as we will be engaging from long range as much as possible. Nako huffed, but sat down at the main seal and prepared to activate it. Okay brat, this better do something amazing. As the Anbu got into position she placed her hand over the seal and began to channel chakra. The effect took a while, but after a couple minutes the seal began to glow. Five lines of chakra shot out to the other seals which also started to glow before shooting their own lines into the barrier. Symbols began to etch themselves into the surface of the shield itself. Inside Orochimaru was grinning like an idiot as he rose from the roof after surviving Serutobi's Doden, Doryuden. Glancing over he saw the seals battling against his enclosure and laughed. So it seems my old teammate is still hanging around with useless old fools. It's too bad for you I know all of his tics. His petty seals will never break through such a powerful barrier. The Hokage smirked. If there is one thing I've ever taught you that you should have remembered, it should have been to never underestimate an opponent. Not a second after the words left his mouth the seals on the barrier finished. The glowing lines slowly connected the five points as they grew from each seal towards its clockwise neighbor. As the lines finished the portion of the purple shield vanished from inside the newly made pentagonal doorway. The two inside had different reactions from rage to glee as the faceless Anbu bolted through the opening, along with the four clones. Seeing he was outnumbered didn't seem to phase Orochimaru much though, and he instead laughed a bit, though he was relieved to see the hole in the barrier closing behind them and the seal spread on the roof burn to ashes. Well, well, well. It seems I underestimated Jiraiya-kun. No matter we'll just have to even the odds. Kuchios. Edo Tensai. Focusing on the dragon hand seal Orochimaru got the greatest satisfaction in seeing their faces as coffins began to raise from the ground. The only one who didn't look concerned was the little blonde Uzumaki. Typical ignorant genin. Focus on the third coffin. Whatever happens we cannot let that one come up. Hiruzen shouted as all the Anbu focused their chakra on keeping it down. No. Let it alone. Naruto suddenly panicked. When he saw them not listening every clone rushed over and grabbed onto the Konoha nins and the Hokage's hands. Stop it now. Naruto. Get away. We have to do this or we'll all die. His argument was pointless however as the last coffin rose and Orochimaru laughed hysterically. You fool. Now you've doomed us all. The Hokage spat at Naruto. He had never been so harsh with the boy, but at times like these it was warranted. The boy may have very well cost them dearly, and if he didn't know it, it showed clearly in his, bright, smiling, face. The front of the coffins labeled, first, and, second, fell away and out stepped two men that all those present had not seen in far too long and yet not nearly long enough. Sir who are those old men? One of the Anbu asked his captain. Shodai Sama. Daden. Nadaim Sama. H Hokage Sama. What should we do? Quote dot 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 quote. Serutobi just glared at the deceased cages. Oh. Monkey is that you. Serutobi you've grown so. Dot old. It seems as though this young one summoned as her. He must be quite powerful. I'm sorry Hiruzen. But it looks like we will have to fight you. With another loud clank the lid to the coffin labeled, fourth, hit the ground and the bad day turned into a nightmare. There, in all his glory, stood the fourth Hokage. Quote dot dot dot, yo yandaimi sama. Well this isn't where I expected to be. The blonde cage looked around and noticed the other cages standing around too. Oh shodai sama, nadaim sama. It's a pleasure to meet you, though I would have hoped to do so in a less tense environment. His voice sounded cold and dead as Orochimaru began to walk up behind them with three kanai in his hands. Two were ready to strike and aimed at the back of the heads of the Shodai and Nadaim Hokages, but they never made it to their destinations as all three kanai disappeared from the Sanin's hands along with the Yandaimi disappearing from the lineup. Well that was fun. 
You can chalk that one up with painting the Hokage Monument Gigi San. He tossed the three kanai and gave a foxy smile before poofing into smoke. Had he not been still facing two of the three former Hokage along with his former student, Serutobi would have been rolling on the roof laughing at the best prank the blonde had ever pulled. As it was, he still let out a loud chuckle. What's the matter old man? Smiling in the face of death. Two cage against one, do you really think you have a chance? Orochimaru was still mad that his plan didn't go completely as he wanted, but having two cage on his side, even if they weren't invulnerable now and would be a little stiff, was still good odds. He still wasn't sure why the fourth had acted the way he did though. It unsettled him a little. I'll just inform you that it wasn't the fourth that you summoned here. It was just a clone of one of my more, creative ninja. I don't know what these kanai were for, but judging by the seals it couldn't have been good, so. Dot dot quote. With a quick flick he tore the tags off each kanai and tore them to shreds, rendering them useless. Two cage against one would normally be a very difficult fight, but I have faith that the odds will be in our favor this time, my foolish student. Orochimaru gritted his teeth and in a flash of hand signs and speed the two resurrected cage began the confrontation signaling the end of idle chatter. Danzo-sama. The invasion of Konoha has started. What are your orders sir? A ROOT Nin knelt in front of his commander with his head slightly bowed. Do. We will do nothing. It's about time those soft imposters under Hiruzen's rule realize just how weak they are. When this is over they will realize just how much they need a strong leader. When Konoha has fallen anew, stronger village will rise from the ashes with me at its head. A cheer would have went through the cavern had this been a normal ninja gathering, but these were root ninja. Men and women brought up to be completely emotionless. The only reactions they showed were curt nods to show they understood. We're being followed. Shino stated. Yeah, they've been following us since we left Konoha. Two teams. All Chunin are higher judging from their chakra. Pakun confirmed. Shino and Shikamaru stutter stepped a bit at hearing the dog talk, while Naruto reasoned in his head. Hey if toads can talk, why not dogs too? He looked back to see the shocked faces of his two human companions. Relax guys. He's a summon. They do that. They nodded slowly, but still eyed the dog warily. So what to do about those ninja? I could set some traps, but there's no guarantee that they'd pass over them or not see them in time. Shino could leave some bugs behind, but that would hurt him later. I'll stop them. Two heads turned towards the Nara. My jutsu are based on delaying an enemy. I can keep them occupied for a bit. Just don't take too long with Sasuke and come get me. They all knew it was a bold move and could have disastrous results. Are you sure Shika? If we don't get back in time. You need to go after Sasuke. You're the only one that can match him that we know of, and if he catches that Suna team Shino would be a lot more help than I would. Don't worry. Leave this to me and you two go on ahead. He turned and gave them a wave over his shoulder. Shino and Naruto gave him a respectful bow before heading off in the direction the dog started heading. Well now all I have to do is wait. Shikamaru started gathering some sticks as he started his plan. Shit he caught up to Mari. Konkuro said to his sister as they bounded through the treetops. The blonde looked back and cursed before making them stop on the next tree branch. Keep going. I'll keep him occupied for a while. We need to let Gara rest some more or he will be in no condition to fight. You are going to fight me alone woman. They both turned as Sasuke landed on the tree behind them. Go. Tamari yelled at Konkuro as she whipped out her fan in a wide enough arc that he had to jump out of the way. Kamedachi no Jutsu. A large gust of wind headed for Sasuke to which he simply moved behind the tree to avoid. Gritting her teeth she shouted again. Fusajin no Jutsu. This gust was slightly different as it tore at the trees creating a fine powder on the branches it hit. After the wind passed Sasuke leapt out onto one of the targeted branches and immediately fell off. Smirking Tamari met him on his decent and flung a handful of kanai into him. When they landed on the forest floor she walked up to his body to ensure the job was done right. The body though puffed out of existence and she realized too late that she was now staring at a log with explosive notes attached. With just enough time to guard her face she was sent flying backwards as the explosion rocked the forest. Sasuke dropped down next to his injured, but still alive victim smirking just as she had. 
Unlike with her experience though, there was no replacement and he was able to kneel down and none too gently punch her in the face. So you worthless piece of Suna garbage. You thought you could stand up to the might of the Uchiha. Let this be a lesson to you. He rummaged in his pouch for a few seconds before bringing out some ninja wire and a kanai. Forcing her off the ground he half dragged her to the nearest tree and tied her up. With Tamari now restrained she was helpless as he ogled her. You're not half bad for a kunoichi. Maybe after I go kill your two brothers I'll bring you back to Konoha with me and I'll use you to breed more Uchiha. You will bear me strong airs. The smile on his face sickened her like nothing she knew could. You'll nay never beat my brothers. Konkuro. Maybe, but Gara. Not a chance. She huffed out around the pain. And Ba bearing your, brats. There are, more worthy pe people than you here. Like Nara-san or that Uzumaki kid. Heck I'd even take that fat kid from the preliminaries over someone like you. That was enough for Sasuke as his smile turned into a snarl and he threw his fist into her gut, making her wheeze in pain. If you're so intent on that doby then maybe I'll just show him how much a slut you are. He whispered in her ear as he brought his kanai around and in a few slashes he had her completely exposed. No one will want you after I'm through, and by the time anyone finds you it will be too late for a medic to heal you. That said he began assaulting her body directly, leaving numerous bruises and scrapes. He was getting so into it he almost didn't hear the sounds behind him. Shit. Not again. Sasuke grit his teeth and shot off into the trees again in the direction the other Suna Genin went leaving a badly battered blonde still strung up hopelessly to the tree. Naruto. Whatever that explosion was we should avoid the area. We don't want to get caught up in whatever is happening it could delay us. Pakun informed the blonde as they leapt towards where the explosion had originated. I know Pakun, but I have a bad feeling about that. Besides you said Sasuke was there a minute ago and it's just ahead. Yes, but Sasuke-san has redirected his path towards the Suna Nin. Shino fixed his glasses a little as he spoke. Fine. You two go after Sasuke. I'm going to check what happened over here. Don't worry I'll meet up with you in a few minutes, just leave me some signs for the direction you went. Without waiting for them to argue Naruto continued on his path while the other two turned off towards the Uchiha's trail. Sorry guys I just have a feeling that if I don't do this things will just get that much worse. His thoughts were stopped as he came to a clearing that sported some burn marks from an explosion. He followed a furrow in the ground that looked to be caused by something that was thrown away from the explosion. When he got to the end there were less pronounced drag marks but he already knew somewhat what he would find at the end. True to his thoughts Tamari was strung up to a tree, exposed and badly beaten. Tem. Naruto cursed the boy as he came closer. Despite her wounds, Tamari was still conscious enough to see the blonde-haired person walking towards her. Okami. Not him. Please not him too. But as she prayed that it wasn't who she thought she felt her binding suddenly drop away and she fell forward. Waiting for the hard impact with the ground, she was surprised that it came so slowly and that the ground was so soft. Looking around for a second she realized that she was no longer near the tree, but rather on a soft patch of grass nearby. I must have blacked out for a bit. What did he do to me? She looked down to see that she was still exposed, but what she didn't expect to see was a green glow around Naruto's hands as they passed over her and she began to panic. WH what are you doing? Naruto glanced up to her before going back to work. Stay still. You have some internal injuries. I'm doing what I can to heal them. I'm sorry I'm not a trained medic though so you will probably still need to see a real one before too long to check you over a bit better. I got the worst of the cuts and bruises though so you should be able to move without too much difficulty. There was silence for a few minutes while Tamari screwed her eyes shut. Embarrassed at being so exposed in front of Naruto. There, that's the best I can do for now. Can you get up? He held out his hand and she took it. With a few stiff movements Tamari got to her feet and covered herself as best she could with what scraps of clothing she had left. Why did you heal me? We're enemies. I could just turn around and attack you. She narrowed her eyes at him. Naruto laughed a bit. No offense, but you're hardly in any condition to fight an academy student, let alone someone like me. Now I have to go catch up with my team before they get in too much trouble. 
Stay safe Tamari San and don't get caught by the Tem again. I may not be able to stop and help next time. For now, here. He threw a set of his own spare clothes that he had sealed in a scroll at her. Wouldn't want a beautiful lady like yourself walking around the woods like that. Now, goodbye. He leapt into the branches and was gone, leaving a blushing girl behind who stared after him for another few seconds before quickly dressing and heading to where her siblings would be. He gave her a second chance and she wasn't going to let the Uchiha hurt her brothers. Naruto couldn't shake the bad feeling that remained and instead of going after Shino and Sasuke he turned himself back towards Konoha. Shikamaru has been on his own for a while now. The enemy hasn't caught up so I can only assume that he successfully stopped them, but at what cost? He raced as fast as he could until he got to where they split off from the shadow user. No one was there, but he did see tracks on the ground of a dog and a few humans. Smart move Shika. Now how far did you lead them? Following the trail he soon was able to hear voices ahead of him. Taking to the trees he kept himself hidden as he got closer. So you know there is another one. Not bad kid, but it looks like your jutsu is almost up. Hey, you can come out now. While you're at it take this kid's head off. Shikamaru's eyes widened and his jutsu was interrupted from the shock as a large shape landed behind him but not as wide as the Odo Nin's eyes got at seeing who it was. A stream of smoke was all the boy needed to see to know who stood at his back, hey. Sorry, but I can't let you harm my student. Asuma charged the ninja and began to take them apart with his trench knives. As the third and fourth nin fell there was some rustling and three Tsuna teams came out of the brush. You were foolish to run off alone Serutobi Asuma. Don't worry though we'll ease your pain. Asuma got into a defensive stance as the group of nin closed in around him. Damn this could be a few too many. The Oto nin were low rank, but there are some high chunin here, and maybe a jonin or two. He stared them down as they inched closer. He spotted a blur to his left and made to dodge it but found no need as the shape landed right next to him. I appreciate the thought Naruto, but this isn't looking good for us. You should have just taken Shikamaru and gotten away. The man grimaced at the thought of the boy who was now in a lot of danger. Naruto just smiled. And miss out on all this fun. No way. So Asuma-san. How many do you want? Oh this is too good. A genin who thinks he can save a jonin by taking us on. Well little kid you're about to find out the worst part of being a ninja. The part where your life ends. On my blade. The Suna Chunin charged Naruto but never made it halfway before he was stopped by an explosion from his back. Oh I guess I forgot to say. I spread some explosive notes around. They're on about half of your backs. Say good night. Naruto formed a tiger seal and instantly the enemy was in a panic, scrambling to get the notes off themselves and each other. Naruto smirked and charged. Taking the hint Asuma followed and they began to cut down the opposition like grass in the confusion. When it got down to two on two they were faced off Jonin to Jonin and Jonin to Jenin. Well this is an odd match up, but I guess I shouldn't have expected anything easier. He said a bit dejectedly as the Jonin across from him laughed. It's just your tough luck kid. Good job though on distracting us so your Jonin sensei could take us out. He's not my sensei. I don't have a sensei. Naruto replied with a smile. Oh, well that's unusual. Naruto's smile turned into a devious grin. I don't need a sensei either. Forgetting about Asuma as he would have no room to concentrate on the man's fight, Naruto charged his opponent as he drew both his katana and his ninja too. The Suna nin immediately took out a kanai and his own wakazashi as he blocked the blows from Naruto. The man couldn't help but admire the blonde's ability with the blade as any opening he left with one blade he covered with the other. Seeing a long fight in the making the nin jumped back to get some distance. Futon. Datapa. The jonin cried out as wind blasted towards the blonde, but to his horror it never reached its target as Naruto made a slash with his strange black sword and the wind bent away from him up into the treetops, knocking a few branches down in the process. Wow. Guess it's not automatically thrown back like I thought. Oh well. Just means I'll have to practice with it. His comment confused the Suna Nin as he charged in again. Don't get cocky brat. I may not know what you just did, but that doesn't mean I don't have tricks of my own. With a flourish he brought out two hands full of various throwing objects. 
Dodge this you little bastard. With all his strength he threw the shuriken, Kanai and Sanban at the boy who rushed headlong into the deadly steel storm. He never came out the other end though as smoke rose from where he had once be. The Jonin looked around for his target as he readied his next volley. Seeing movement to his left he flung more of the projectiles towards what he assumed was his target. He was rewarded with another fluffy white cloud as it rose off the forest floor. Come out and fight me you coward. Fine. The whisper was so close and so filled with killing intent that the Jonin froze. Before he could spin around though he found a figure not his target land in front of him as the sharp pain of a trench knife sliced through his stomach. As the Jonin fell Naruto looked over him. Asuma-san I was having fun. He pouted at the man. Asuma not expecting to see Naruto there just laughed and rubbed the back of his head. Uh sorry Uzumaki-san. I just thought I'd help out a bit. Hope you aren't too mad. The boy just waved him off. Meanwhile Shikamaru was sitting on the ground nearby, completely in awe of the display of power the two had made in front of him. Nay, Asuma, take Shika back to the village. I have to go catch up to the Tem and probably rescue his ego before it pops and blows up half the country. He darted off as Asuma and Shikamaru just chuckled after him. He really is in a class all his own isn't he Asuma sensei? He sure is. I don't know which thought is scarier. How strong he is now, or the thought of how strong he can be in the future. I do want to ask him about that sword though. I know I've heard of it before. If it's the one I think it is then it's got to be powerful. I would say too powerful for the hands of a genin, but I doubt even Hokage-sama would be able to take it away from him. Don't bet on that. If the Hokage asked for it, Naruto would give it to him out of loyalty. That's one thing about him that still hasn't changed. They both spared one last glance in the direction their topic had left in before Asuma picked Shikamaru up and headed for Konoha. Damn it he caught up again. You better still be alive Tamari. Konkuro was standing on a branch facing the smirking Uchiha. So you managed to beat my sister. Maybe you're not a complete Konoha loser then. Beat her. Oh I more than beat her. And after I finish with you two I plan on going back to where I left her tied up and ready. She'll be the first to bear the next generation of Uchiha. You should feel honored knowing that the blood that runs in your veins will continue on through the children she has. Sasuke laughed at the fury on the puppeteer's face. You bastard. Like hell I'll let you touch my sister. I'll die before I let that happen. Then die. Sasuke was about to charge in, but was stopped as two new arrivals came out. One of which he turned livid at seeing. You. How are you even able to move? Her change of clothing wasn't missed by him as he pictured the only one he knew of that wore such attire. He had to admit though, the tight fit did do wonders to show off her assets. Tamari glared at him. Because it seems not all of Konoha's ninja are complete barbarians asshole. I'm glad to see you're alright Tamari. Take Gara and run. I'll hold them off this time. He's too strong for you Konkuro. Besides I owe him for our last fight. Tamari started to get her fan ready for action. Forget it. You're too low on chakra and hurting. Even I can see that. Now take Gara and go. It wasn't a request it was an order. One of the few he ever gave her but he only did so when it was serious. He watched as she picked up their brother and reluctantly left the soon-to-be battleground. Now come Uchiha, show me your strength and I will show you your weakness. Konkuro called out as he readied his puppet, Karasu. Again Sasuke attempted to make his move. Uchiha-san I will take this one. Since he was supposed to be my opponent initially I would like to not be robbed of my battle again. I will be finished in 10 minutes to back you up. Shino was one person that Sasuke didn't really have too many qualms with as he never knew what the stoic boy was thinking. While he still held his Uchiha superiority over him, Sasuke was willing to back down this time in favor of the bigger target. Fine. Do what you want, but I won't need backup. He replied as he disappeared into the trees. Hey get back here I didn't say you could leave. Konkuro spun around and sent Karasu after the raven-haired boy. Don't turn away from you opponent. Shino said as he swung at the distracted puppeteer, but Konkuro ducked under and kicked Shino away. You don't seem to have much fear of monsters Konoha boy. Show me this monster then, and I will tell you if I fear it or not. No. Beat me and go help your friend. Then you'll see the true monster. 
Bringing his puppet back, Konkuro sent it into battle as Shino started letting his bugs out. A new battle began as the two clashed. Naruto was headed off by Pakun as he jumped towards the sounds of battle. Pakun what's going on? I hear fighting up ahead. The Abarame boy is fighting a puppet user. He doesn't want help so it would be best to go around. Though it is ultimately your choice I would suggest we go after the Uchiha. He took off after Tamari and Gara. At the moment that is the riskier fight as it's two against one. Yeah, but it would be risky even if it was just Gara. He's becoming unstable. I can feel it. We need to stop him soon or else we're all in trouble. Lead me to them. Then you can leave. This fight will be no place for you. Naruto concentrated on what might happen in the near future and didn't like the scenarios his mind conjured. HMPH. Don't underestimate me because I'm small, but I'm not the combat type so I'll do as you say. Pakun leapt ahead and they made a wide arc around the current battle, keeping a safe distance so they wouldn't get dragged into it. So what took you so long to catch up? I would have thought you would meet up with us while we were talking to the Suna team. I found where the explosion came from. It was Tamari that fought Sasuke, and lost. But she was there too. She was beaten pretty badly and he shredded her clothes. I healed her and gave her a new set of clothes. That explains the tight fit. Pakun grinned a bit. Bet you got an Eiffel then. Naruto scowled at the dog. I helped her and left. That was it. He snapped. Then switched back to a calmer demeanor. After that I got a bad feeling that Shikamaru was going to get into trouble soon, so I retraced our steps and got there just in time to see his Kajmane end, but Asuma-san showed up and started taking out the trash until Mornin showed up. That was when I joined in. I created a little distraction and we eventually won. Asuma stole my kill though. After that I sent them back to Konoha since Shika was low on chakra and came to catch up. Now here I am. Well I'm sure Asuma and Shikamaru are thankful, but you put the mission at a bit of risk there Naruto. What would have happened if we ran into trouble we couldn't handle? Pakun scolded him. If you haven't noticed, both of my teammates decided to take on their opponents themselves. Touche. And the Uchiha. I'm more worried about Gara if he loses control. He glanced at Pakun, but if the dog wondered what he meant he didn't show it. We're here. Naruto looked through the treetops and saw a transformed Gara standing off against an exhausted and beaten looking Sasuke while, surprisingly, a determined looking Sakura stood between them with a kunai prepared to stab. Shit. Go look for Tamari, make sure she's far away. I'll deal with this. They both shot off determined to complete their assigned tasks. Chapter 19. Invasion Naruto vs Gara. Haku cheering for her later was because they had all worked on strategy for their initial opponents together. Having known that the goal was humiliation, it was more entertainment for her and Naruto than watching a skilled fight between Kunoichi. Anyhow, here is chapter 19. I know some people will be upset because the Naruto, Gara fight is so close to canon, but I had other parts one wanted to write and really couldn't think of the fight going much a different way. I mean, come on, he's up against a released biju. I think I made up for that in the other parts though, we'll see. Gara, in all his grotesque glory, leapt from his perch towards his prey. Soon mother, soon you will have blood. He stalled slightly recalling an old memory of a time when someone else had the same expression on their face when protecting others again. Shaking the thought aside he was about to smack the girl away but was stopped as a foot implanted itself in the side of his face. I'm sorry Gara-san but as much as I despise these two I can't just let you kill them. Naruto said as he landed on a branch between Gara and the other two genin. HN, like I needed your help to beat him Dobi. The Uchiha are the most powerful. Sasuke never got to finish as Naruto backhanded him away into the forest behind him. Hey, don't you hi, then sent his faithful banshee sailing right behind him. Like I said, can't let you kill them, but you could have knocked them out. Such a pain in the ass. Meanwhile Gara was watching the scene, not quite sure what to make of the boy in front of him. Normally people would run in fear from the sight of him. They would run even faster when they saw his sand come out, but when he started to transform they tended to become sniveling piles of flesh that he would feed to. Mother. You, entertain me greatly Uzumaki Naruto. 
Gara flung himself forward much faster than he had against the Uchiha, but apparently not fast enough as his target disappeared from sight, only to reappear with an axe kick to his head. Gara plummeted through a couple branches before he was able to catch and right himself as he landed on the third one. Seething with anger and excitement he let some more sand slip out and cover the other half of his body. So this is how you transform. Naruto looked on curiously as bumps formed all over the surface of Gara's new body. Soon a shuriken. Gara watched Naruto's eyes widen a bit as the sand projectiles shot out. There were far too many over too large of an area to dodge. To his annoyance though Naruto did manage to dodge all but three hits, and even those were negligible. Mother is getting impatient Uzumaki Naruto. She wants to taste your blood. Another round of projectiles shot out, but the blonde was prepared this time and those that he couldn't block were sliced from the air. Gara-san if you don't calm down you are going to make me have to get serious. Come Uzumaki. Let us prove our existence against one another. Gara shot out at the boy who simply jumped over the charge. Stop dodging Uzumaki. Stop running like a coward and face me. Naruto ignored the other Jinchuriki for a minute in favor of another task. Kuchio's no jutsu. In a small puff of smoke two little toads appeared. Hey and Naruto. What's up? Gamakichi looked around a little before laying eyes on Gara. Um. Sorry boss but I think I'll sit this one out. Oh can it Gamakichi. Take Gamatatsu and head over in that direction. You'll find two Konoha Nin, probably unconscious. Do what you can to wake them up and get them out of here, got it. Can I have some candy? The lighter of the two toads asked, completely ignorant of the situation. Okay, not completely. He saw Gara and waved to him with a happy smile while Gamakichi slapped his forehead. Maybe if you get them both to go back to Konoha. Now go. Naruto quickly tossed them away as Gara came sailing toward him again. Sorry for the interruption, but I'm not letting that Uchiha prick die from our fight. I want to knock him down myself. Now where were we? Naruto crossed his fingers and surrounded himself with clones as Gara prepared another charge. When the Suna Genin threw himself forward once more, Naruto spread out his copies and rushed rushed in to meet him. As the huge sand arm swung his way he jumped to the left receiving a boost from the clone there just as a tail pierced through its chest, dispelling it. The other clawed arm attempted to grab him out of the air, but again he rebounded off a clone that was there. This continued for around half a minute before Gara got bored and began to suck air into himself with the many mouths that opened all over his body. Futon. Muggen Sajin Datapa. A ferocious wind ripped through the trees causing all of the clone to instantly disperse and Naruto to fly away from his target and into a tree. Okay. That one hurt. The blonde rubbed what he could reach of his back in an effort to lessen the pain. But at least I can get my payback. Making a ram seal Naruto watched in satisfaction as the seals he placed on Gara during their little dance glowed brightly just before clouds of dust from the explosions hid him from view. As the dust settled, Gara stood distorted and looked to be melting with how his sand was sliding from his body. H how. Dot how could he know to hit where my sand armor is the thinnest. With some difficulty he glared at his nemesis, but the effect was greatly lessened by the fact that only one of his eyes was visible and that one was half covered by sand. I thought the Uchiha was doing well against Gara, but this guy doesn't even seem phased by the killing intent that's blasting the area. Hell I'm all the way over here and even I'm shaking. Tamari thought as she watched the battle unfold. A rustle sounded in the bushes behind here and she barely registered it, but was able to turn around to see a small pug dog sitting there with its paw raised. Yo. Pakun said as the girl turned to him. I'm assuming you're Tamari. Naruto asked me to get you away from here. He said it's going to get dangerous, and judging by what I've seen so far I would have to agree. Tamari was startled at hearing the dog talk but she had heard other animals talk before so she shrugged it off. I can't leave my brother. I can't just run away and let him die. She turned back to the battle in time to see Naruto create an army of shadow clones and begin to completely demolish Gara. She sat there with her jaw on the ground as Gara fell through the trees and smashed into the forest floor, shaking the earth around them. They sat there and watched as neither fighter moved for a few minutes, but that quickly ended with a huge spike of chakra. Tamari fell flat on her ass and even Pakun backed up a bit. 
Tamari-san I suggest we leave now. This is getting ugly quick. The girl nodded dumbly, but didn't move until he bit her on the wrist and started to forcefully drag her away. It didn't take much to motivate her though. As soon as she turned her head away from the scene she quickly set to the trees, intent on gaining as much distance between herself and the battle as she could. Hakun just went along for the ride as he was still attached to her wrist. Naruto felt the chakra spike, but was a little too late to avoid the sand that screwed itself through all of his clones as he was once again thrown backwards. When he looked up towards the canopy through the curtain of bloody hair that now draped over his eye he saw a giant sand creation. Shit. His thoughts were broken as he felt something gathering around his feet. He shot up just in time to avoid a tendril of sand that was about to snake around him, landing on the next branch up. He was forced to jump again though as the sand followed him and more tendrils joined the first. This just keeps getting better. He yelled out angrily as he ran through the forest at the base of the giant tanuki while he thought of a strategy. So, this is the Aikibi. Uses sand obviously, and wind. Fire could work well against it, but with his size it'd have to be really hot and really big. Plus, it would incinerate the host too. I can't do that to Gara even if he is a little insane. It wouldn't be right, like killing myself. Water might work though, either way I have to wear it down. His thoughts were broken as he heard a very loud, high-pitched scream. Yada, I'm free. Finally I can destroy things again. Not good. Bunta. Wiping some blood off of his face Naruto gathered his chakra and slammed his palm into a tree he was about to pass. Kuchio's no jutsu. With a huge cloud of smoke that quickly blew away in the wind, Naruto now stood atop the boss toad Gamabunta once more. What? Kid why'd you summon me? The toad looked around a couple times before spotting Shukaku. Quote dot dot dot. I see. I found something I want to kill. Futon. Rinkuden. The tanuki's stomach bulged grotesquely before it shot out two orbs of condensed wind. Gamabunta responded by jumping out of the way. Ha ha got you now. Futon. Rinkuden. Two more bullets shot out towards the giant amphibian. Kid you better think of something to do quick. We're not going to be able to keep this up forever. I may be a strong summon, but this is a biju. Sweden. Tepidama. The toad boss shot out his own attack and two orbs of water met the Aikibi's attack halfway, exploding in a shower and soaking the forest around them. He used some technique to give Shukaku control. I was too busy dodging for my life to see what it was, any ideas. Naruto called out over the roar that Tanuki gave in frustration. Tanuki Niri no Jutsu. He growled out. The host forces himself asleep allowing the beast inside to take control. We need to wake the host on his head, but getting close is going to be tough. Hang on kid. As soon as they hit the ground they leapt forward as Gamabunta unsheathed his blade. Gamato Susan. Slicing was heard as the sound of metal threw stone. As they settled on the other side Shukaku's arm fell from its body and disintegrated into the forest. Damn I was hoping to end it with that, but he's too dense. Kid, we're going to have to try to wake up the medium. That hurt. I'll get you back for that. Rinkuden. Naruto and Gamabunta were forced to dodge to the side before shooting in as the toad tried to grab onto the sand behemoth. Shukaku just took a half step backwards, making his assailant slide off before hopping away. Shit I can't grab a hold of him. Kid. We're going to have to get creative. We'll use a kanbi henge to transform me, but. I'm not that good with hand seals so you're going to have to do the seals and think of a form. Something with claws and teeth would be good. I'll provide the chakra. Get ready. They were forced to dodge another barrage of air bullets before they started to charge in. Now. Henge. A huge puff of smoke shot out from the two covering what they did until the modified Gamabunta shot out as none other than the QB. Hey nice one kid. The toad thought as he rushed forward, but once again had to dodge as another shot of air came at them. Gathering some trees in his new tails he jumped at the Aikibi, who reacted with another volley off attacks. Gamabunta tossed the trees in the path of the attack causing them to explode in a shower of sawdust as he dove right through. It was too close for the Tanuki to dodge and he latched onto the sandy form biting into it in order to keep his grip. Mao shid. Now kid. Channeling a bit of chakra to his feet for the jump, Naruto leapt over to the Aikibi's head and landed on its snout. 
As he started to run towards the sleeping form of Gar though he found himself quickly sinking into the soft sand beneath him. Shit. He couldn't go forwards or back now. I know I really don't like this, but I don't have much a choice. Fox. Time to pay rent. With a burst of orange chakra the sand around Naruto's ankles was blasted away and he was able to make it a few more feet before more sand was able to stop his progress again. Thinking quickly now that his trump card failed, he took out one of his scrolls and flung it at the other boy's forehead. Wake up you stupid prick. The scroll bounced right off Gara's forehead and an inhuman scream sounded through the area. No. I just got free. I hate you. Hate you. H-A-A-A-T-E-Y-O-O-O-U. The screaming was cut off though as the sand beneath Naruto and a slowly waking Gara began to crack and crumble. Naruto slightly registered Gamabunta telling him that he was too low on chakra to stick around, but when he disappeared the sudden rush of air blasted away a portion of the now soulless sand causing the entire structure to come crashing down. The two Jinchuriki plummeted to the treetops, landing on the top of adjacent branches as they looked across at each other. It's over Gara. Give up. Why? Why are you so strong Uzumaki? You who are like me. I will not die here. I will prove my existence. Forcing himself to stand Gara shakily gained his balance on the branch as he looked over at Naruto who looked only slightly beaten, but was panting as well. At an unseen signal they both leapt towards each other, clashing in midair. It was Naruto though who was able to get the final hit as he swung his fist into Gara's jaw. It wasn't really the smartest move though as the force stalled both of them and they continued their descent to the forest floor, hitting numerous branched on the way down. With a loud thud they slammed into the ground. After the pain and disorientation settled a bit they looked at each other. To Gara's horror Naruto began to stand a bit shakily and lurch towards him. S stay away. My existence will not end here. It's lonely Gara. I know, but you have to find those who will protect you, and that you can protect in turn. People that will stand beside you no matter what. Those are the ones that will save you from your hell. Find them. Naruto shifted forward once more. But if you try to take my precious people away, I will stop you, I will hunt you with every fiber of my being and I will destroy you. As he went to shift again three thuds hit around them. The only ones he could distinguish the owners of were the two nearest Gara. Tamari and Konkuro landed next to him and dragged him to their shoulders. Uchiha-san we ask that you let us leave in peace. This fight is over for both our sides. Tamari looked to be glaring over at the person that landed closest to Naruto. HMPH like I care. I just came for this. Naruto felt something get tugged from his back and was instantly furious, but he was too tired to do anything. Even so he managed to turn on his heel and glare at Sasuke. Tem that is my sword. If you plan on stealing it from me you better be ready for the consequences. Hey Dobi, I don't plan on just stealing it from you. Sasuke unsheathed the blade from its sheath. I plan on killing you with it and blaming it on them. Quicker than they all thought he could move in his state, Sasuke shot forward and aimed a strike for Naruto's neck. Everyone's eyes went wide, but a blonde and purple blur shot forward and a clang of metal was heard along with the slicing of flesh. Naruto looked down at his chest to see his own blade sticking out of it. It didn't register at first, then he felt something coming up his throat and he started to vomit, blood. T. Tem. Slowly he collapsed forward to his knees, then to his side as he hit the ground. No one moved an inch, until an insane laughter sounded through the trees. And that's why you are the Dobi. Never cross an Uchiha. Sasuke then turned to the reason why he had missed his original target. If you ever interfere with my business again bitch I'll do the same to you, after I make you moan my name and beg me to make you mine. Another clang of metal was heard as Tamari shot her fan out and knocked the boy into a tree nearby. She advanced on him but was forced to stop and block as a pink-haired Kunoichi came up behind her and tried to slice open her back with the same sword that had been sticking through Naruto a moment before. You would dare try to attack me from behind you little. Tamari. We have to get out of here. I can sense some more of them coming. We can't be here when they show up. Konkuro yelled over to her with urgency. The girl glared at her target before pushing her away harshly. She hurried back to her siblings, but not without a quick glance to Naruto. Good he's still breathing. If they get here soon. 
she turned to look back at the other girl who was now tending to the Uchiha. It was obvious who her concern was for, but at least she wasn't going to outright kill her fellow blonde before the other Konoha nin could arrive. Joining her siblings they quickly leapt off into the trees and away from the battle scene. Tamari. Konkuro. Both of them looked at their brother a bit shocked. I'm sorry. Quote dot dot dot. Uh, I it's okay Gara. It was a small exchange but it was a start. Not knowing how to react though they continued on in silence. Back with Naruto, he could barely feel as his body was unceremoniously shuffled around as his things were taken from him. He couldn't believe the nerve of whoever it was, though he guessed it was Sakura. That thought was confirmed as he was kicked in the side, which was a lot softer than what the Tem could have managed. When he gave no response the girl must have thought him dead as he heard her scuffle off towards another area nearby, cooing soft words to her Sasuke-kun. It was the last thing he heard before he passed out. Sakura was brought out of her comforting when a group of Anbu along with Asuma landed nearby. Most of the Anbu went directly for the downed Uchiha while Asuma and another couple headed for Naruto. What happened here? Asuma asked. That Suna Genengara turned into this monster, then a huge raccoon thing, but we're safe now thanks to Sasuke-kun. He saved us all from that thing. Sakura laid the praise on thick, not even bothering to incorporate the other Konoha Genin's fight. Nor the fact that he had been the one to fight and ultimately defeat the Tanuki. What about Naruto? PFT, as if that loser could do anything. He deserves what he got for getting in Sasuke-kun's way. The Pinkett scoffed at the boy, but refrained from the urge to spit at him. Asuma on the other hand sensed something wrong, but put it to the back of his head as he looked over at the Anbu tending to Naruto when they called out to him. He's alive. Dot but in bad shape. Looks like he got stabbed by a sword or something here in his stomach. He needs medical attention. All right, you two get him to the hospital as soon as you can. We'll tend to the others here. What about Sasuke-kun? You need to get him back fast, he could be seriously hurt. What if he dies? Screeched Sakura causing more than one ear to bleed. The Uchiha will be fine. He looks to have, at worst, a concussion. He'll wake up soon enough and we'll walk back. Now gather your things and get ready to move out. Asuma ordered. They aren't my things, they're Sasuke Kuns. He earned them. At this point the smoking man was too annoyed to argue. Whatever just picked them up and get ready to go. He watched as the girl huffed and mumbled about how the boy would show them all one day and they would learn to respect those with power. Genma was having a tough time dodging Baki's seemingly endless wind jutsu as they battled it out on the arena floor. It's a good thing you have bed aim Suna trash, otherwise this might have been a challenge. So says the Konoha scum who hasn't landed a single hit. It was the truth. While Genma hadn't hit Baki a single time, the Suna Janan managed to scrape him a couple times with his wind blades. That may be true, but my body count is still higher. At least I don't need fodder to come and block attacks on me. Suna Chunin bodies littered the ground around them. The reason Baki was so unharmed was because of the number of ninja he had ordered to assist him only for Genma to make quick work of them. Che. Like I needed them. Futon. Hissen Kays. A gust of wind shot from Baki again, forcing Genma to jump to avoid it. The Suna Janan smirked at his fortune. Now die. Kays no Yeba. The wind blades shot out towards the airborne proctor as he looked on with glee. His celebration was short-lived however. As the blades hit Genma he burst into smoke revealing the body of one of the fallen Suna Chunin. Baki cursed as he searched the area for his target frantically. Hagain no Arare. The sound of Genma's voice made Baki shoot his head up towards the wall of the stadium where he saw the man perched on the side. His attention was drawn more to the massive raid of Sanban that was now headed his way however as he tried to dodge the area attack. Even with his speed and armor, the needles turned out to be just too dense and he was struck in the leg shoulder and back. To his credit though, only getting hit a few times in such an attack is a testament to his skill. Sneaky little bastard. A Konoha brat like you would use such an underhanded attack. Baki tried to move his arm to form another jutsu, but to his horror the Sanban in his shoulder seemed to have pinched a nerve causing his whole left arm to go numb. We're not saints Baki, we're ninja. Maybe if you went into this fight realizing that you wouldn't have been caught off guard so easily. 
Genma hopped to the arena floor to face his opponent once again. Che I don't have time for this. Using his good arm, the Suna Jonin reached into his vest and threw a few smoke bombs down at his feet. Genma got ready for the attack, but it never came. Che, coward, all that noise just to run away. Oh well, looks like there is still plenty of game to be had. The fight now over, he leapt to the stands and searched for his next target. Sandame Sama, Shodai Sama and Nadaim Sama are not getting back up. It seems that since those seals never entered them that the technique never completed. One of the two still living Anbu stated as he joined Serutobi's side from the forest that now sprouted from the roof of the cage box. All that's left is Orochimaru and the four maintaining this barrier. The Sandame sighed. Good job. Now stay back and try to do something about this barrier. I'll take Orochimaru. Like I should have all those years ago. The old man got into a fighting stance as the snake Sanin started laughing. You seem to be breathing rather heavily, sensei. That's why you will wither and eventually die, but I won't let myself succumb to the same fate. You see I will never grow old and die like all the feeble fools around me. Orochimaru grinned evilly. Why you didn't? You've completed that jutsu haven't you? The Sandame's eyes were wide as he thought through the implications of what his former student had done. The Sanin simply reached up and peeled his face away, revealing the face of a young female before he began to laugh hysterically. You see sensei, while everyone around me will grow old and die, I will simply hop around to the most convenient body. The Hokage was sickened. Quote dot dot dot, how many innocents have you taken? This is my third body, and I've already taken steps to acquire my next body. One that will allow me to further my goals of learning every jutsu with unsurpassed ease. Uchiha. Sasuke. He watched the man smile in confirmation. He is a shinobi of Konoha. I won't let you take him. Ku ku ku. It's not your choice. The boy will come to me to seek the power he craves. Power that you cannot give him. As long as I stop you here you won't be there for him to go to. Kuchio's no jutsu. The old man quickly summoned his old, faithful ally. The monkey king Enma. Enma, I will need your help with this brat. Please transform into Kongonyoi. The elder monkey looked towards their opponent. Obvious distaste showing on his face. So the time has finally come, Orochimaru. This would have been much easier had we taken care of him back then Serutobi. A man and his monkey. How exciting this fight is becoming. Though still annoyed that his Edo Tensai had failed, Orochimaru was still confident in his ability to overcome his one-time sensei. After all he had a fresh young body to pit against the miserable old man. As the monkey transformed into the diamond staff that Hiruzen now swung around, the snake brought out his Kusanagi sword. It may not be able to cut through Kongonyoi, but all he needed to do was get around the staff and cut the old man holding it. With Kusanagi's poisons, even a shallow wound would fester enough to distract an opponent enough to deal a killing blow. Let's see how well the monkey can dodge the snake. With that he charged and the battle began anew. Strike after strike was dodged, blocked or parried. Everyone was deadly accurate for both sides, but with the experience both had it was near impossible to land any hits. It was the Sandame who broke the repetition though as his staff shot out and slammed into his opponent's wrist. Luckily for his target it wasn't the one that was holding the sword, but that didn't make it hurt any less as the bones snapped, causing him to wince. The Hokage was soon on the defensive again though as Orochimaru gained a new fervor from the hit. The swipes began to close in closer until he jumped back in order to get some valuable distance. This seemed to be a mistake though as the Sanin shot his arm out. Sanejishu. Snakes sprang out from the man's sleeve and headed straight for Hiruzen who batted them aside furiously, trying in vain to push the tide of scales away. To his merit only a couple got through, but it was enough to leave some nasty bite marks on his arms causing the muscles to spasm and the staff to clatter to the ground. It seems you're slowing down old man. Nothing I wouldn't expect from someone who has aged so much. Orochimaru burst through the snake corpses now littering the roof, intent on ending the fight against the defenseless cage. His blade was blocked once again as the forgotten staff turned back into Enma as he grabbed the Sani. You're not going anywhere snake. The monkey growled as he held the man by his sword arm. Now Hiruzen. End this. Orochimaru struggled in the great ape's grasp. 
Let me go you failure of a summon. I will end this today. Sarutobi slowly, shakily got up from the ground. Glaring at his ex-student through half-lidded eyes he began a set of hand seals. About halfway through Orochimaru made a desperate move and with a flick of his wrist, Kusanagi flew towards the aged cage. With Enma's grip on his arm though his aim was off, and instead of hitting him in the heart the sword only impaled him in the stomach. Foolish student, look around you. The village will not fall because the will of fire burns too brightly in all of its inhabitants. Your plan here has failed, now burn away and leave this world in peace. Kaden. Karyu Enden. A white hot stream of fire blew out towards the Sanin as he struggled in Enma's grasp. At the last second, the Monkey King pushed him to throw off his balance before leaping away. Orochimaru was able to follow suit after regaining his balance, but not without a cost. As the flames got close he threw his arms in front of him to guard as he jumped as fast as he could. As the jutsu ended he let his arms fall limp from the pain that now coursed through them from the intense heat of the fire. Blackened skin flaked off revealing that even the flesh underneath was well cooked. Damn you you old bastard. You'll die for that. With the slightest movement he could make with his fingers he activated one of the abilities of Kusanagi and forced the sword from Serutobi's stomach, causing the man to grunt and fall to his knees. With the last of the feeling in his arms fading he shot his fingers forward once more he made to pierce the man's heart this time, but was once again thwarted when Enma jumped in front of the blade, taking a hit for the old man. Damn you monkey! Orochimaru could only yell his curses as the feeling in his arms left him completely. Moving to finish the pair off with his feet if he had to, he snarled as the two Anbu reappeared beside them. Hokage-sama. One of the two knelt down to check on his leader while the other stood at the ready. He's poisoned. I I don't know how bad, but we need to get him help soon. Two Naruto clones landed next to the Anbu and took up ready stances as well. Hey hubby Tem. I want to thank you for the opportunity to study you unique seals. One of the Naruto clones grinned at the Sanin across from him as the man looked on slightly confused. You really should take some more lessons though. You made a lot of basic mistakes. Here let me show you one. A little payback from the poor souls you used for your little ritual, and punishment for trying to do the same to Kin Chan. Boom. The clones made tiger seals as each activated the seal arrays on two of the coffins that Orochimaru had landed near. Without warning, both of them exploded in a shower of smoke and splinters as a shape shot out away from the Konoha group. The Sanin was even more furious now, but couldn't think straight through the amount of pain he was feeling now. Not only were his arms burnt beyond recognition, but he also had numerous spikes of wood sticking out of random points in his body. So it was that kid that messed with my seals. To do that with so little time though. I haven't seen skill like that since Minato. I swear you will die soon enough brat. He snarled as he took in the scene before him. The two clones took up ready positions once again, prepared for anything the snake might try. They flanked the Anbu captain as his subordinate took care of the Hokage. They still had numbers on their side, and they would do their best to keep him away from his target. Orochimaru knew his time was up. The two downed opponents would have been easy, but with the two Anbu now present, and the troublesome clones of the blonde brat. Dot dot. Even he knew when to withdraw. It's over. We're leaving. At the sound of his command the four that were sustaining the barrier nodded, slightly surprised, and let it fall as they rushed to their leader's side. Get my sword and let's go. Don't try to engage them. Konoha's Anbu are that rank for a reason. Two of his subordinates grabbed him and started jumping away while the female of the group picked up the sword and followed leaving the odd man with multiple arms covering their escape. Since the barrier was now down more Anbu swarmed in, some of which attempted to chase after the fleeing traitor, but were stopped as a thick webbing shot out and ensnared them, followed by a spread of golden kanai. They were left only ensnared though as two puffs of smoke signaled that they were saved by someone they hadn't expected. Both Naruto clones had attempted to pursue as well, but chose to sacrifice themselves for their comrades rather than attempt to fight four possibly high-ranked ninja and their mostly disabled leader. The Anbu with the Hokage were a different story though as they did their best to patch up the old man. He was fading fast and they did what they could to stabilize him before rushing him towards the hospital. They all knew what had happened by now, and the outlook was grim. 
They could only pray that it looked worse than it was. Elsewhere in Hai no Kuni, three Suna Genin were making tracks for the border as fast as they could with one supported on the other's shoulders. All they wanted to do at this point was to get home and rest after their long fights. Tamari was still the worst of the three. She remained bruised slightly from her encounter with the Uchiha along with a couple new ones from being a little too close to the final battle between her brother and Naruto. Why did I help him? Was it to repay him for helping me, or just because I found it wrong that that black-haired bastard would do such a thing or just because he reminds me of Gara? Arg. Not the time to worry about this Tamari. Time to get back to Suna. She looked over at her youngest brother and couldn't help the smile that started to cross her lips. Then again, at least something good came from his loss. Maybe, maybe we can remake those bonds we should have always had. On the other side of the Jinchuriki, Konkuro was lost in his own thoughts. We did research on the Abarame dammit. Nothing mentioned that they would be that strong or that they used traps. They were supposed to only use their damn bugs and that's it. If he would have followed that information at least I would still have Karasu. Abarame Shino. At least I hit you once, that's all that I needed even if you did blow up my puppet. Though I do wish we could have met again later. Between the two Gara was completely silent. Alien thoughts entered his mind and he was having difficulty sorting them out. Uzumaki Naruto. If they hadn't shown up it would have been your existence that was proven this day. Am I weak? No. Dot you were just stronger. What was it that made you so strong? You said it was you precious people that you wanted to protect, but who are they and why would you go so far for them? Uchiha Sasuke. He was supposed to be your comrade, but he attacked you instead of us. Why? He shifted his gaze to the left and right slightly. Perhaps I will try your method. Perhaps I will try to let people close. Dot one more time. Where do you three think you're going? The trio of Genin stopped suddenly and whipped around in a defensive stance as best as they could manage. They came face to face with one person they really didn't want to see right now. Baki Sensei. We are disengaging due to Gara's extreme exhaustion and me having no adequate weapons since Karasu was destroyed. Without them, our part in this invasion is finished. We're going back to Suna. I think not. Konkuro. Take Gara back to Suna. Tamari. You still have your fan. Come. We're going back to help the others. Baki leered at the teen as she started to back away. Baki. Why are you here? The sound of Gara's voice shocked the other three. Two. To make sure you three are doing your jobs. If we don't all do our jobs we aren't going to win this fight. Baki. We are a long way from the fight. Why are you here? I am your leader. You dare question my orders. Baki. Mother smells. Your blood. This made all of them step back in fright, but none more than Baki himself. S. Stay back you brat. We have a war to win and this is the best action. Let's go Tamari. Mother says you're lying. We can smell your heat from here. Baki you have hounded my sister far too long, but that doesn't matter anymore. Gara wound one hand up into a half ram seal and it was only then that Baki realized that he was standing on a sand pocket. It was too late for him to react though as the sand spun up around his body. Unfortunately Gara was only able to cover up to the middle of his chest due to his low chakra supply. Baki, if you live through this, give my regards to the Konoha interrogation department. Suna Gomangu. They all heard Baki's scream as they stood there transfixed by the jutsu. The man that had been such a pain during their entire stay in Konoha was now emptying his lungs as blood began to spill out over the rim of the sand. It only took a couple minutes for the jutsu to cause the janin to pass out. The Suna siblings looked towards their brother to find him nearly gasping for air as he glared at their sensei. As his sand began to fall away, they were able to see the damage he wrought upon the man, making them turn from the sight as each hole was displayed. The holes were spread out only a few inches in places and it was obvious that they were meant to cause pain. Their wonderment stopped though as Gara dropped to a knee. Tamari was at his side in an instant to catch him before he fell the rest of the way. Gara. Protecting our precious people. That is what Uzumaki said would make us strong. In his fading consciousness, the last thing Gara felt were two arms wrapping around him. His first hug in more years than he could remember. It felt nice. 
Dripping water greeted him as he slowly awoke. Opening his eyes he found himself in a dark tunnel. Great. Not only do they stab me when I'm down and steal my possessions, but they also went so far as to dump me in a sewer. I feel so loved right now. Naruto groaned as he slowly got to his feet, using the wall for support. Checking himself over he saw that he was actually in pretty decent shape physically. Guess the fox is keeping up his whole survival deal. At least some good comes from him. Well no point in standing around, better find my way out of this dump. Slowly he trudged through the shin-deep waterways until he heard what sounded like, breathing. Following the sound he soon came upon a large gate in an even larger cave-like room in the sewer. As he took in the massive structure in front of him he noticed the seal paper in the center and wondered what it could be for. He only got a moment to study though before two giant red eyes slowly opened and stared down at him. So the boy finally decides to show himself. You're lucky those Anbu came when they did, otherwise we would be dead. The eyes moved forward revealing a massive body of red fur that seemed to glow as the dim light that seemed to emanate from the walls hit it. Why you're the QB? Naruto's eyes widened in realization. Then took on a look of confusion. But if you're here, then where exactly are we? Inside your mind child. I must admit, I'm impressed that you're not cowering in fear right now. Would you mind telling me why that is? The large being boomed out. Well, I'm pretty close to a hallway that I'm rather certain you couldn't fit down for one. You also seem to be somewhat stuck behind a large impenetrable object. Aside from that you, intrigue me. Naruto took on a calculating gaze as he took in more of the fox's features. From his elongated ears to his nine flowing tails not a hair seemed out of place. You seem rather well kept for a demon fox you know. QB chuckled a bit as he took to his haunches. Boy, do you not realize with whom you speak? I am the lord of all demons, the QB no Yoko. I am nobility in its highest regard, short of Kami-sama. Do you not think it appropriate that I keep myself looking as such? Hey, I'm just going by what I was taught about you. The pictures we've seen aren't exactly, pleasant. Nor were my encounters with other biju. Considering I just finished fighting one that seemed rather insane. I would have to lean on the side of the textbooks for descriptions so far. Yes, the Aikibi, Shukaku. I watched your fighting, quite impressive for a human. Shukaku however, unnerves me. Something must be wrong with his Jinchuriki in order to cause him to behave that way. If you see him again, try to find out what is going on. Aside from that I will also let you know that I am impressed with how you have lead your life. Hiding your true intentions in order to benefit the greater scheme. Dot dot. However, I want you to stop that pitiful act altogether. You hold in you the QB. Lord of all demons. I will not have a weak vessel, and while I am pleased with your current abilities I will not be satisfied until you have surpassed all and have risen to the top. Now leave me we will discuss more on this matter later. You have business outside, such as getting our possessions back from that conceited Uchiha. With a flaring of chakra the giant fox pushed Naruto back into the land of consciousness. Do not disappoint me Naruto. You have no idea of the destiny you possess. Once again Kyuubi shrank back into the shadows and closed his eyes, contemplating his next move. Beeping and white was what met Naruto as he woke from his slumber. A dull ache was all that remained in his chest from his injuries. The room itself almost blinded him as he tried to get used to the brightness. Sense assaulted his nose in a violent yet familiar mixture. It smells like, home. Lazily he let his head fall to its side as he looked towards the window only to find his vision obscured by two heads, one blonde, one brunette. Eno. Haku. He smiled at their sleeping faces before turning his head towards the door. Hanada. Kin. Tenten. The last was confusing, but he was still touched that so many had come to see him. He made to move but in doing so let a groan of discomfort slip. It might as well have been a cannon going off for how quickly the surrounding Kunoichi shot up. Naruto-kun. Shouted three of the girls. Naruto-sama. Came Kin's voice. Oh hiya Naruto. Tenten said with a smile and a wave. Uh. H how long? Dot was I out. He managed to mumble. Almost two days. Said another voice from across the room. Quite the feat considering how worn down you were. 
not to mention that hole you had in your stomach. Naruto looked over to see Kakashi leaning in a corner reading one of his books and ignoring the glares of the females in the room. Kakashi. What are you doing here? I would have thought you'd be with your team. Sasuke got away with minor chakra exhaustion and was released yesterday, despite the orders for the doctors to notify a ninja when he was awake. Sakura was just sparsely bruised and didn't even need to be here, but chose to stay with Sasuke. Shino was poisoned, but his father took care of it on the field. Shibi was rather impressed when he saw the remains of a puppet scattered around the area. I think you may have a client. Kiba was with the others that failed during the preliminaries and they were pretty well guarded. He still managed to get his first kill and keep fighting. Typical of an inexperienced Inazuka to fight blindly. He's lucky he was able to limp away with a sprained ankle and a couple kanai jabbed into his arm, in addition to his previous injuries. He'll be in here for a couple more days for observation just in case the kanai were poisoned. He flipped his book closed and put it away before coming closer. Naruto. The Sandame fought Orochimaru. Even with your help in getting some Anbu in he was still cut pretty badly by Orochimaru's Kusanagi sword. It was emitting poison and we can't really fight it with what we have available to us. Naruto. He stands a good chance at dying. Kakashi expected the boy to cry out, tell him he was lying, run out of the room screaming to see the Hokage. Instead what he got was cold, heavy silence. Naruto drooped his head. He didn't want to believe it. His surrogate grandfather was, dying. No, he wasn't dead yet. He was still fighting. As long as he fought Naruto would not give up. He let his head hang a second longer to gather his strength then looked at the Jonin with as much determination as he could. Tell me what I need to do. A simple phrase, but the determination caught the room off guard. What? I will save him. Tell me what he needs and I'll get it. Naruto I. Tell me. The fury behind his voice shook the walls of the room causing the closest nurses to rush in to see what was wrong. They were quickly shooed away however by Kakashi while the five girls tried to compose themselves. Naruto. This isn't as simple as going out and finding some medicine. The Kusanagi's poisons are unique to the sword. They change themselves, frequently, just about every time it kills. It's almost impossible to find a cure. We're already having a hard enough time just keeping it from spreading too fast. We've already had to amputate his arm. The gray-haired ninja lowered his head. There is one person who could help. A new voice sprang from the windowsill as all heads snapped in that direction. Aero Senen. Tell me. The pleading in his eyes spoke volumes of the meaning the old man had to him. Possibly even more meaning than the man had to his own students. Jiraiya scratched his nose. Quote dot dot dot. My old teammate. Tsunade. Naruto racked his brain for a second. Tsunade the legendary healer. Best at her craft, but no longer in Konoha. He looked at the man. I'll do it. I'll find her and drag her back here by her hair if I have to. Don't worry you won't be going alone. I'll be going along since I have a task that involves her as well. I've been ordered to find her and bring her back here. The Sanin said, though he seemed a bit reluctant, and his fears were confirmed when he saw Naruto's eyebrow twitch. You were ordered. By who? With the Hokage out of commission who would have the power to? The council, but it's ninja only now isn't it? There's an old bylaw that states that if the current Hokage is temporarily unable to command in a time of crisis then the council is to act in his or her stead. There's a loophole though. It states that both sides of the council are supposed to take charge to ensure things run smoothly. With all of the commotion going on around the village there was only one shinobi representative in the council chamber at the appointed time when the daimyo came to help restore order. Dot. They decided that it would be in the best interest of the village to have experienced council members reinstated. Naruto. The whole civilian council is back and they seem to be out for blood, yours. That's why these lovely ladies, Kakashi and myself took it upon ourselves to watch over you. Luckily after the clans got word that the civilian council was out they rushed to the chambers before too much damage could be done. The evidence against them for what they were arrested for though was destroyed by their order. Their pet projects paid for by Konoha money, personal purchases using what was meant for shinobi gear and many reports of muscling their way into the council seats through any means necessary. 
There wasn't a clean one in the bunch, but now they're all out free. As Kakashi spoke the room seemed to darken more and more as a heavy amount of killing intent laced the air. Naruto were going on this trip to find Tsunade to not only find her to help Sensei, but to get you away from the council's grasp. Who was it that allowed this? What shinobi allowed those bastards loose? Naruto's eyes narrowed as he glared between the two older men. Jiraiya straightened up getting ready just in case the boy made a dash for his soon-to-be enemy. Hayuga Hiyashi. Then he will die. The girls gasped as the coldness in his voice. Ma. Ma. Naruto. You can't just go out and kill a clan head. Kakashi tried to bring out a lighter mood, but it was clear this was no time for laughs. The bastard tried to take Hinata-chan away from me. He has been against my existence with every step I take. No, he won't die right now, but his life is forfeit by my hands, I swear it. Everyone looked at Hinata to gauge her reaction, but surprisingly she looked only slightly saddened. Hinata-chan. I'm sorry, but I can't allow people to keep pushing me around like they used to. I it's okay Naruto-kun. He is one half that created me, but he has never been a real father. I will feel sad that he's gone. I think. Dot but if that is what it takes for us to be together in peace then I will accept it. Hanada lowered her head and let a single tear fall from her eye to the hand she clutched in her own. Quote dot 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 quote. Naruto kissed Hanada on the crown of her head and whispered a few soothing words to her. The only reaction the others saw was the slight nod of her head before Naruto once again sat up. He looked around the room a bit and saw his clothes. He also saw that they lacked his equipment. Anger boiled anew and he didn't really need to ask the question since he already knew the answer, but he had to make sure. Where is my gear? Kakashi and Jiraiya pointed to the pile of clothes. Yes, those are my clothes, where is my gear? Jiraiya pulled out a scroll with a lone spiral seal on it. This is the only thing, aside from Eugenin, that the Anbu team that picked you all up were able to find. Naruto shot out of bed, ignoring the slight vertigo, and snatched the scroll before grabbing his clothes and heading for the small bathroom. In minutes he was dressed and had joined them again. What are you planning Naruto? Some of the girls, like Hanada, had been around him long enough to know something was wrong and he was in a hurry to fix it. I'm going to get my stuff back. Channeling his chakra into the spiral, he unsealed the scroll and quickly opened it to the first seal. Naruto if someone took your stuff then they are probably either long gone or guarding it well. You're going to need more than one scroll. Jiraiya said as his perch on the windowsill got noticeably smaller. Naruto shifted his eyes over to the man. For that Tem and his bitch this is all I need. Everyone in the room saw Jiraiya's eyes widen as he saw whatever it was that Naruto held before the blonde was nothing but a blur crossing the rooftops. After a few seconds Jiraiya finally broke the silence. Quote dot dot dot. Well he seems in a hurry. I guess he knows who this Tem is that took his stuff. He was roughly shoved aside once more as more bodies piled through the window. Hey. What the hell. The Sanin's words fell on deaf ears though as the whole crew from the room bounded after the boy. Man, no respect at all in the younger generations. He turned and followed the pursuit intent on knowing what was so damn important. Naruto sped across town towards his estate. If he was lucky the Tem hadn't found the key yet. As he got closer though his heartbeat raced and a cold sweat developed on his brow. The gate was wide open and it looked like people were filing in. Thankfully nothing was coming out. Dot yet. Within seconds the flow of people was cut off as a very pissed off Jinchuriki landed in their midst. Who the fuck do you people think you are? Without so much as a hand signal there was a puff of smoke and Naruto's covered the area. Civilians and shinobi alike were dragged away kicking and screaming like babies as the clones formed a perimeter around the property to catch anyone that might try to escape with anything of value. Meanwhile the real Naruto stomped inside and began unceremoniously knocking people out left and right. He may not have had any non-lethal weapons, but he still had his bare hands. Dot in his trump card. Once the front yard was cleared out he made his way inside. Kakashi and the girls landed outside the Namikaze estate amongst the chaos and cursed. They tried to shout at Naruto before he entered the house, but he didn't acknowledge them as he slammed the door behind him. They would have followed but two obstacles stood in their way. 
The first was Naruto's clones who were firm in not letting anyone pass, even the girls. The second was that the gate was closed now. Meaning no entry without a poison needle taking them out. Reluctantly they delegated themselves to trying to organize the mob that had gathered, calling for the demon's head. They would have argued against them, but that was when the screams started. Inside Naruto was horrified. People were rummaging through everything in the house, boxing or bagging it up as others were tallying what all was there. Anger raged inside of him as he slowly pulled his mother's sword from its scabbard. Everyone within hearing distance stopped what they were doing and turned to the boy. Sadistic smiles plastered on their faces as they prodded him about finally releasing the Yondaimi's possessions from the monster's grasp. This stopped however when Naruto slammed his hand on a seal near the door. Clicks were heard around the house as doors and windows locked. Shutters slammed shut, and in an instant the house was almost pitch black. You think you can come into my house and take my things? These are Yandaimi Sama's belongings demon. We're taking them back from your clutches where they can find places with people who will apra. The man's words were silenced as a dull wet thud sounded in the room. For the crimes of breaking and entering, burglary, vandalism, and breaking the Sandame's law. Dot dot quote. He readied his blade as chakra seemed to flow out of him causing a low red glow through the house. Quote dot dot dot. I sentence you to death. Before most of the people could blink half the room was now on the floor, lifeless or close to it. It wasn't so much an execution as a massacre as Naruto went room by room slaughtering and slicing anyone and everyone he came across with no exception and no remorse. Even those who pleaded for mercy and told him they'd never bother him again were coldly told they should have never started in the first place before they too joined those on the floor. Oh. Shit. Haku said. Kakashi and Jiraiya looked over to the X sound nin. What is it Haku? He activated the siege seals. It's over. She tried to explain. Siege seals. What do you mean? What the hell is going on in there? Jiraiya questioned further. Hanada elaborated. They completely seal up the house, both from outside attacks. Dot and internal escapes. Judging by the amount of killing intent right now I would say that our house is no longer a residence right now, but an execution ground. At Haku's clarification many eyes got wide as they looked towards the house in terror. The screams now made sense and with each one the crowd flinched. Straightening up to his full height Jiraiya turned to the crowd. Just what the hell were you people thinking breaking into his house? Now all those people inside are probably dead or about to be because of your ignorance. B but Jiraiya Sama, we were rescuing Yandaimi Sama's property from the dem. Just like those inside, the woman outside found herself staring at her own, now vacant, neck. The people around her flew back and screamed as blood sprayed the ground. Apparently, you all have forgotten the laws around this village. Naruto lawfully bought this property from the Hokage, which made it and everything in it his. Not Yandaimi Sama's, but Uzumaki Naruto's. That means anyone that he catches trying to get into his house and take things without his explicit permission he can lawfully execute without punishment. I hope for your sakes you don't have many friends or family in there, because as of now their lives are forfeit. At his word people started to frantically look around for their loved ones that had come with them. Screams of terror outside now matched those inside as people realized that the family and friends they had thought to bring along would never again be seen alive. They begged the Jonan and Sanin as well as the gathering Anbu to save their loved ones, but all they got in return from at least the two unmasked men were harsh glares while the Anbu stood by helplessly. Finishing the upstairs, Naruto made his way back downstairs to cover the last two rooms. The halls were crowded now as bodies littered the floor, but he managed to find himself outside his office. Slowly he opened the door and took a precautionary peek inside. The room was in disarray as papers seemed to have been tossed everywhere. The cabinets were all open and their contents spilled out across the floor. He could see fragments from the pot that concealed the entrance to the hidden room laying about. Chancing the loss of surprise he opened the door a little further and was enraged to see four very recognizable ninja garb-like Anbu huddled in the corner where the pot once stood. They looked to be laying out an array of explosive notes on the floor that he knew all too well what their purpose was. Cautiously he stepped into the room and hid himself on one side of the desk just as one of the root shinobi checked the room. Hurry up. I just got a bad feeling. 
Oh can it. Just because those moronic civilians are celebrating the saving of their precious Yandimi's trash doesn't mean you need to worry. If they see us in here they'll probably just think we're normal Anbu. Now let's take some cover and blow this thing out the wall. The four moved around the desk as Naruto followed suit as he grabbed a brush and flicked it through an ink puddle on the way. Once all the root had taken cover Naruto rushed over to the seals and began messing with the array as much as he could. He didn't have time to analyze them since the ninja could blow them at any second. When he was satisfied he leapt back to the desk and waited for the inevitable. Quote dot 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 quote. Quote dot 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 quote. What the hell is going on? They aren't exploding. The root took a quick glance over the top of the desk and saw that the seals were indeed just sitting there, though smoking slightly. Did we get a dud? Impossible I checked them all myself. You guys stay here just in case it blows. I'll have a look. The man got up and started making his way over to the corner where the seal was. As he bent down to inspect it he never noticed the shadow sneak out from the vacant leg space under the desk. A quick slice and the man was lowered to the ground as the image of his assailant wavered and changed. The root nin made room as their comrade rejoined them. So did you fix it? Yeah we had some overlapping seals. Which of you put these down? The man handed out a few seals to each of them so they could see what he meant. Wasn't me. I've never seen anything like this. Nope. I don't carry seals with me. All three looked at the last man who just shrugged and shook his head. The one who handed them the seals then got up and turned to face them, crossing his arms. Well one of you did it and it could have cost us a lot. Listen we'll deal with this later. Let's just blow this thing open and get out of here. No I'll deal with it now. As the root nin made a snake seal it was far too later for the others to realize their mistake as each seal suddenly exploded in their hands and released an assault of needles into each one of them. Masks and chest plates may be able to save you from the occasional kanai or sword, but against a hail of needles they might as well have been wearing leaves for all the openings the pins were able to fit into. The strongest one was only able to flop forward onto his hands and knees before succumbing to the poisons that coated the needles now protruding from his various unprotected areas. The last thing he saw was his leader's image waver before it revealed a blonde-haired genin scowling at him in disdain. It's gotten quiet. I wonder if it's over. Tenton whispered, the oppressive atmosphere. Let's hope so. If the gaki goes too long he could lose himself. Jiraiya whispered back. Behind them the crowd began to part as a grim procession made its way forward. Kaharu and Homura at its head. Now what could possibly be going on to draw so much attention? Kaharu murmured aloud. The civilians seemed to tense, but then looked between the house and the new arrivals with madness in their eyes. Counselors that monster is killing our villagers. We demand you do something about this travesty. Is that so? Killing innocent villagers. Well now that I believe comes with a very high punishment. The counselors grinned menacingly as they took their time to make their way to the front of the crowd. Excuse me counselor, but he is well within his right as a. That has yet to be decided Sanin. For all we know he could have invited them inside in order to slaughter them. We withhold our right as keepers of the peace to detain Uzumaki Naruto for this crime until a date where he will be judged and punished. We are witnesses that he has done no such thing. He had been unconscious all morning until just recently. Kakashi argued back. Spare us your drivel we have no need for it. Homura spat at Kakashi. Their tirade would have gone on longer, but new people began to arrive. To the relief of the seven ninja between the counselors and the estate it was the ninja half of the council. What is the meaning of this crowd? Ah Hiyashi sama what excellent timing. It seems that we caught the Uzumaki brat indulging in some of the baser forms of his instinct. As we speak the child is slaughtering those inside his house. Innocent civilians that meant no harm. That is hardly the true. Silence Jenin. You will speak if spoken to and not a moment sooner. Despite the elder Hayuga's harsh glare, Haku met him eye for eye. Their conversation was cut short however as new screams pierced the air. These though made one of the council members pale. My baby. He's killing my baby. Everyone looked to the Haruno head as she began to scream hysterically. Hurry up and get us in there. Now finished with the office Naruto had one last place to look. The library. He could hear mocking singing and laughter from a voice he knew all too well. 
It made him cringe at just how off-key it was, but still he descended the stairs. In the middle of the floor, amongst half-filled bags of scrolls with numerous others spread about her was the little, pink-haired, Uchiha whore. Silently he crept up on her, unsure of whether to kill her outright or let her live. Quote dot dot dot. Hello Sakura-chan, he whispered in her ear, causing her to freeze solid and turn her head slowly towards him. Sakura was met with a sight she never wanted to see in her worst nightmares. Behind her stood Naruto, but she could have dealt with that. It was the blood that covered him from head to toe and his feral grin that tore at her mind, making her mind scream at her to run away. She couldn't though, he was between her and the only exit. Why you're supposed T to still be B in the Ho hospital? Well, sorry to disappoint. You see, I tend to heal quicker than most, so when I recovered this morning I decided to check up on my house, and what do I find? He shot his head towards her his eyes red with hate. I find the people I protected trying to steal my things. Don't worry though, I took care of them. You see the wonderful thing about laws in this village are that they are so infrequently updated that I can pretty much twist them to my needs. There are delightful laws that let me deal with, intruders as I see fit. Now the only question I have is, how did all these people get into my estate? You wouldn't happen to know would you soccer a chan? This was getting worse and worse for the girl. It was supposed to be easy. She found the key when she took his things and figured she'd use it to get all his jutsu for Sasuke. Sure she let other people in, but for all that the blonde put her beloved through she'd figured he deserved it. It was fair wasn't it? She hadn't done anything wrong, right? After all. Well there are a few ways to go about finding out if you don't want to talk. Personally I'd like to try a few of them, but I'll give you one chance to fess up before I begin. H ha. L like a baka L like you will sc scare me. A little news flash baka. My M mother is back in charge now eh and once she gets here you're d dead. Oh I'm sure she's already here but this is my property for a reason. I have many security measures in place. Right now this building is locked down tighter than the Hokage's vault. Naruto walked slowly around her until he was standing right in front of her kneeling form and looked directly in her eyes. Right now it's just you, me, dot in a house full of corpses. Ha 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 ha. Naruto laughed menacingly as Sakura stood and bolted for the stairs, screaming for help. Naruto walked slowly behind her in no rush whatsoever. Give me a good hunt. Sakura-chan. Sakura ran from room to room, trying every window, every door. Nothing opened to her prying fingers. The menacing form of Naruto trudged slowly behind her as she rushed from each possible escape point before he could catch up. She could tell he was enjoying this from the look on his face. Her voice never seemed to quit as she screamed even when she tripped over a random body, or body part. Staring into the faces of those that preceded her to the grave only caused her volume to raise. She was sweating bullets as she came to the last possible room. The upstairs bathroom. She clawed at the frosted glass of the window in a vain attempt to breach it as Naruto crept closer and closer. The room was far too narrow for her to dodge around him, so instead she did the only thing she could. Naruto watched as Sakura slumped down on the floor of the basement and curled into a crying ball. Pitiful. Falling apart at the slightest genjutsu. It almost makes me wonder if you even tried being a ninja at all, but I already know the answer to that one. Dear, dear Sasuke-kun. Get up. He pulled her roughly to her feet until she was eye level. Now tell me what I want to know. How did you get in my house, and why? Sakura was crying openly now as tears flowed freely down her cheeks. I f found your k key. M mother said Sasuke kun would be h happy if I got him your jutsu. I just wanted him to l love me. She sobbed out. I see. Dot all for love huh? Well guess what? Your love means shit to me. Love doesn't make you steal from others, no that's arrogance and stupidity. The inability to see the bigger picture. I have been used and abused my whole life, and I'm tired of it. You will admit what you did in front of the entire village if needs be, but the blood of those that lay dead upstairs is now on your hands. Start walking. The screaming stopped almost as suddenly as it started. Then, 
After many tense moments, the front door to the house opened and out stepped Naruto with an unsteady and still crying Haruno Sakura being forcefully marched in front of him. He walked her to the gate, but didn't open it. Now speak. You let my daughter go you monster. Shut up Lady Haruno. Remember whose hands your daughter's life is in right now or I will be forced to remind you. Naruto held his blade up to the girl's throat earning gasps from the gathered crowd. Some from the audacity of the boy, others from the sword he wielded. Now speak. M. Mommy. I don't wa want to do this anymore. W. H. Y. Did you make me come here? She cried out towards the council member she knew best with pleading eyes. Isako for her part looked rather uneasy at this point. What is the meaning of this Haruno? Soon glared at the woman who had enough sense to back away. Tell us Sakura. What did your mother have you do? Much to Naruto's distaste though the girl shook her head violently. Fine. Inoichi-san I ask that you scan her mind as a possible traitor to Konoha. Gasps were heard with one coming from the girl in his grip as she struggled to get free. Struggling against a simple mind walk Haruno. Something to hide. He chided. Naruto-san I don't think. Inoichi began, but was cut off. Daddy. Do it. Ino stared at her father with unflinching eyes. Honey. I don't think it's appropriate to do this in front of a crowd. It wasn't appropriate for them to try to ransack Naruto's house either, but that didn't stop them. Ino was glaring at him now. Inoichi knew his daughter was right. He was allowed to interrogate someone in the open if the situation called for it, and right now, with the way Naruto was acting, it could mean the life or death of the person he held. Judging by the state of his attire it was pretty obvious that he wouldn't shy away from such a deed either. Fine. He walked over to the gate where Naruto held Sakura within arm's length. Naruto-san I have to be in contact with her head for this to work. Would it be possible to let me in? Hi. Sakura-chan. Please unlock the gate. I believe you still have my key. Naruto asked with a smile. Acting in a daze, more out of fear of getting cut than thinking of the implications, the girl reached into her pouch and drew out the estate key, earning some hard looks from those outside from the simple action. The fact that she knew exactly where it was without looking or asking more or less proved that she knew it was on her person and not planted. Sakura unlocked the gate as Naruto forced her to step back in order to allow room for Inoichi to get in. As soon as he was inside though Naruto kicked out to shut the gate on those trying to rush it, namely Isako and some of the Anbu that came with the civilian council, as he grabbed his key back. Now I will give you one more chance Sakura, to tell us what happened, before Yamanaka-san here takes a nice little stroll through your memories. Naruto gave her a moment, but despite the obvious fear in her eyes matched with the quivering of her lips she refused to talk. Fine. If you would please Yamanaka-san. Inoichi was torn a bit. This was a council member's daughter after all, and there was no concrete evidence against her. Despite that he knew that the boy holding the blade was serious and as such his choices were limited. Resigned to his fate he placed his hand on the pink mop of Sakura's hair, closed his eyes and began to channel his chakra. Sakura stiffened for a moment, then went mostly limp as her mind was now at the mercy of Konoha's top mental interrogator. Naruto allowed his blade arm to drop to his side since there was no longer a need for it at the moment. As soon as their minds connected the man wanted to throw up. The area he was in was obviously thought up by a very girly girl. Pink was the primary color scheme, but there were a lot of other pastels around. The only other extremely prominent thing were the numerous pictures of, what he could only guess was, her portrayal of Uchiha Sasuke. Closing his eyes to gather his thoughts he held out a hand and was rewarded with a large scroll shooting into it from nowhere in particular. My god, it's like she has no capacity to block any mental attack. Has her obsession with the Uchiha dulled her thoughts so much? Setting his own thoughts aside he began to scan her recent memories. The first ones he came across were from inside the house as he began his trip backwards. One thing he noted as they made their way back to the basement was the bodies, but also that there didn't seem to be enough blood. Yet at the same time the girl's mental projection of the blood made it almost as if they were drowning in it. Borderline hemophobia. Finally arriving at the basement he found out exactly what he was looking for. Sakura recounting how her mother encouraged her to this action. He wouldn't stop there though. No, he needed to see the interaction with her mother and, 
if he could, how she got his key. Delving forward he relived the terror of Naruto's genjutsu, but again wondered at how easily it should have been broken. Wasn't this girl supposed to be one of the top kunoichi of her class? He flashed forward a bit through her packing up the jutsu scrolls. Then through her letting people in and her thoughts on what would happen because of letting the gate open. Honestly it disgusted him that she would think so little of the boy that had done so much to help his village. After a few minutes of pointless interactions he finally got back to the girl's house. Mom. Look. I got the key to Naruto Baka's house. Sakura gleefully announced as she approached her mother in the kitchen of her home. Isako turned around and looked at the small piece of metal in her daughter's hand like she was holding a fist-sized diamond. S. Sakura honey that's great. What do you plan to do with it? The girl smiled even brighter. Since Naruto Baka is in the hospital I'm going to go over and take anything that might help Sasuke-kun. With that as a present he's guaranteed to fall in love with me. Why what a great idea honey, but I think we should do a bit more. After all don't you think that dem. Naruto deserves it for hindering Uchiha-sama so much. When her daughter gave her a confused glance Isako explained further. I'll just call up a few people that would be interested in certain items in the house. Don't you think there are more worthy hands for Yandaimi-sama's possessions? She smiled as Sakura's eyes seemed to light up. Yeah, that Baka deserves to lose everything for what he put Sasuke-kun through. Good girl. Now go ahead over and get started while I inform some people about what needs to be done. Isako shooed her daughter back out of the house with an evil smile before the door shut and the memories continued. So she not only encouraged it, but most likely got this mob started. That still doesn't tell me how she got the key though. Continuing his search he riffled through more recent memories of the girl going through the village. Her time spent with the Uchiha as he recovered, which nearly made him wretch. Then her being escorted back by the Anbu and Asuma as she glanced worriedly at the Uchiha and with disdain at Naruto. Back to when the older ninja showed up at the small clearing. Noticing her just standing up when the other ninja showed up he was relieved. Finally. Something that looks promising. He went back in her memories a bit to get a full picture and was rewarded with a view of Naruto's last hit on the Tanuki which he laughed at a little with how unconventional the beast's ultimate demise was. He watched as both of the fighting genin tumbled into the treetops as the memory shot through the trees. A fall from that height. No wonder he was in such bad shape when they found him. The vision stopped again on a branch overlooking the two genin. It shifted momentarily to the side as the Uchiha landed in the same tree. Both parties, and the mental invader watched as Naruto spoke to the Suna Jinchuriki, but they couldn't hear what was going on. All Inoichi could make out was that Naruto, despite the obvious pain he was in, was limping forward intent on keeping the village safe by ending the life of its threat. It wasn't until the rest of the Suna team appeared that something very interesting happened though. Soon after they showed he watched as Sasuke leapt down and joined the conversation, then right in front of the new observer he took off Naruto's sword and stabbed him with it. Inoichi almost left right then out of rage, but decided to stay since he hadn't seen anything dealing with the key yet and it seemed like there would be more interaction with the Suna Kunoichi. The fact that she stopped the blade from hitting anything vital intrigued him. Sasuke got thrown back away from Naruto and faster than he thought the girl could react, Sakura jumped down and unceremoniously pulled the sword from Naruto's gut as went after Tamari. Now that he was close enough to the action he suddenly regretted it since he was forced to hear the girl screeching first hand. Luckily the Anbu were on their way and the Suna team bolted. Once again he was intrigued by the look that the Suna Kunoichi gave to the fallen blonde before she left, but was brought out of his musings when his vision shifted to Sasuke. After checking him over a little Sakura went back to Naruto. She couldn't have been about to kill him since he's still alive, so why? Dot dot question mark single quote. His question was answered as she quickly emptied all his pockets and piled their contents, including the key, into both Sasuke's and her own clothing. After she kicked him to check for signs of life he was thankful that the Anbu got there when they did. Having seen more than enough to incriminate not only Sakura, but Isako and Sasuke as well. He let his mind recede until he was once again standing in the front yard of the former Yandaimi's home. The onlookers watched as the Yamanaka head came back to the land of the living. 
he took his hand off Sakura's head before turning her around roughly and grabbing her by the collar. Haruno Sakura is under arrest for theft from and assisting in the attempted murder of Uzumaki Naruto as well as neglect of an injured friendly ninja on a safe battlefield, attempted theft and vandalism of a privately owned property and breaking and entering a protected property. Gasps and shouts erupted from the crowd as Sakura's eyes widened and she started to cry. With a big smile on his face Naruto opened the gate and let the man and prisoner out. Thank you Yamanaka-san and I'm sorry if your trust in my generation has wavered from this. Before the man could speak they were joined by the older Haruno as she tried to pull her daughter from his grasp. How dare you accuse my precious girl of such a thing. That monster deserves what he got and you will not punish my daughter for doing what was right. Smack her rebuttal was ended with a backhand from Inoichi which forced her to the ground and earned more gasps from the crowd. How dare you hit a counselor. Even if you are a clan head this action is inexcusable. Denbi shouted at him. Inoichi just glared at the man, and the rest of the civilians before settling his gaze back on Isako. Haruno Isako is under arrest for instigating the mass looting of a privately owned and protected property as well as encouraging the means of entry, aiding in a burglary and attempting to assist in the escape of a convicted criminal. I have done no such thing. Isako screamed but it was fruitless as Anbu appeared to take both her and Sakura. You daughter was kind enough to show me your interaction earlier and as such has shown the fair grounds of these charges. Take them both to sub-level B and put them in separate cells. We'll deal with them later. As quickly as they arrived the Anbu were gone, leaving an open-mouthed crowd and council wondering what was going on. Their thoughts however were interrupted by the sound of a sword being resheathed. Again, Thank you Yamanaka-san. Naruto bowed to the man before turning to the crowd. You all showed up hoping to get a piece of my property. Well you will find out now that you will get back even less than you came with. I won't lie and tell you that everyone that decided to enter my house is still alive and well. Dot dot quote. Many cries and shouts of monster were heard at this, but Naruto ignored them. Dot but I will tell you that it was only those that broke the Sandame's law that were brought complete justice upon. The rest received punishment, but as you can see now they are still alive, mostly. That said he stepped aside as a parade of clones exited the house carrying numerous people through the gate. It was difficult to tell just how injured some of them were just by looking, but as they were laid out it was obvious that their chests were definitely rising and falling. Families rushed forward to check on their loved ones as additional people were brought forth in a long cycle of clones entering and exiting the house. It took a while, but when bodies wrapped in sheets began to appear the crowd knew that any relative or friend that had been inside that wasn't already out, would not be joining them in conversation again. While this was happening Naruto once again addressed them. You may have noticed that there are more living than dead here. Be thankful that only those few were dumb enough to break that major law. The rest simply saw fit to try and steal from me. Let this be a reminder that I don't take to thievery or trespassing kindly. Now get them out of here. I have more important things to do with my time. As the last set of clones exited the gate he once again locked it, but before he could take off there was a hand on his shoulder. Yamanaka-san. Where are you going Naruto? To get back my property. He shook off the man's arm and turned to leave. Don't worry. I won't kill him. He deserves much worse. He may need some medical attention when I'm finished though. With that he leapt off as a few people came up to the only man who seemed to know what had happened. So where's the gaki headed? I would have thought he'd want to stick around until this sorts out. Jiraiya was the first to question the boy's actions. Just like he said, he's going to get his stuff back. It seems the Uchiha is going to be in for a painful day. He's going to attack Uchiha-sama. He must be stopped. How dare he attack our savior? Kaharu nearly screamed, making many wonder if she was related to the Haruno women. When the Anbu that arrived with the council went to move he shot in front of them and halted their advance. You will do nothing of the sort. That boy has been pampered far too much and it will do well for him to be reminded of his position. He may be the last. Loyal. Uchiha. But he is also a shinobi of Konoha, and as such there are rules he must follow. Based on what I saw he has broken a fair few of them. Also, based on that same information I hereby issue a warrant for the arrest of Uchiha Sasuke on the grounds of falsifying a mission report, 
theft of a Konoha citizen's property, attempted murder and willfully accepting known stolen goods. How dare you make such accusations of Uchiha-sama? What proof do you have of such allegations? Homura strode up to the small group with a scowl on his face. Simple. Based on the memories from Haruno Sakura, it was Uzumaki Naruto that defeated the Suna Nin Sabaku no Gara by fighting him in his Tanuki form with Gamabunta. Uchiha Sasuke, taking advantage of the weakened Uzumaki, stole his sword and stabbed him with it. Haruno Sakura placed some of Uzumaki Naruto's possessions on the Uchiha's person who in turn made no motion to return them. As such Uzumaki-san is well within his rights to pass judgment upon Sasuke as per the laws of Konoha. No doubt you council members agree being as you were there when some of said laws were put into place. Inoichi grinned at their sudden discomfort. A calculating mind he may be, but he also disliked the civilian council and their constant scheming and bickering. The two elders could only sputter out unintelligibly as they recalled the laws they themselves put into place to protect their own homes from possible ninja theft. That's it for this part if you enjoyed it then like, share and subscribe for the next video as it's going to be more interesting and also check out my other playlists hope you would like them too.